Okay, everybody, welcome to tonight's shear. Thank you for joining us from around the world. We appreciate it. Tonight's shear is shear number 78 with the Let's Get Real program with Coach Menachem Bernfeld. And we appreciate everybody for coming here. I always start off every week telling all of our members, thank you for promoting us on the WhatsApp statuses and telling people about the shear, about the programming and letting people know about it. We have tremendous growth, tremendous uh, amount of followers now. And every week the shares are getting better and better and better. Um, if anybody wants to join the WhatsApp stat- chats with the status is just uh, WhatsApp me personally at 848-525-0066. It's 848-525-0066. And um, I'll say save the number and I'll send you every Sunday the flyer. For anybody who's watching this share the review on YouTube, please click on the like button and click on the, the subscribe button, button. So one day we could be as big as Rebecca Goldberg's uh, YouTube channel and make millions of dollars from it, just like him. That's the goal over here. So please uh, click on the like button. I want to start off first thanking all of our advertising sponsors here in Lakewood, the Lakewood Scoop for promoting us here. A special thank you to Robbie and Yanif Chazak for promoting us. And a special th- thank you to Chaya Lekaufman and Shmuel Summer for promoting us on all the digital Jewish platforms. Again, if anybody's here the first time, every Sunday night at 10 p.m. on this Zoom ID, we have an amazing program, usually Rabbanim, therapists, amazing people, and um, it's been wild. Next week, on November 7th, we're going to be having a, an amazing program with with uh one second i'll get to that in a second we're doing a test run because of by popular demand to start at 9 30 because many people say that they're, they're that they're going to sue me for sleep deprivation and gesel shinoi for keeping them up to 12 12 30 one o'clock in the morning so we're going to start trying a little bit earlier next week for 9 30 for what for four weeks and we're going to see how that goes and we'll see uh if it works better for everybody it's a little bit hard for me because i'm a, I'm a night i'm a night owl i usually wake up around 9 p.m so uh, I'll have to get things going first. <laughs> um, again, uh, next week, November 7th, we'll have an amazing episode with the world famous. He's a businessman. He's a sales coach. They hire him in all the big companies, the Forbes companies he's, he's spoken to. His name is Adam Lieberman. He's a famous guy. And he's going to be speaking on a topic that I think is relevant to everybody. We want it. We have it. We need it. The challenges and opportunities that come with money and Parnosa. We're going to be discuss, discuss, discussing both angles. People that are very wealthy, the, angle, the, the, the situations they have to deal with, and like most of us, the struggles of Parnassa and just paying our bills, how to deal with that. So please tell everybody about it and try to come next week. It should be amazing. Tonight, we have the schus of having with us world-famous uh, rabbi, Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg, from beautiful, sunny Boca Raton, Florida. He's here tonight. Hopefully, I'm going to be visiting you around January time. It should work. Can't wait. Looking forward. It's getting a little cold. And uh, let's start off first with opening comments from our host, Coach Menachem Berenfeld. Menachem, blow it open. Thank you, thank you very much. Welcome everyone to another episode. Baruch Hashem, we have this first to have Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg tonight. The truth is, we're still coming down from last week. Rabbi Yossi Zakatinsky, he mentioned about panemius in Torah. And we're trying to figure out what panemius is for those who were able to go a little bit deeper. And he did mention that it takes time till you find the right Thing that connects the safer whatever it is and he mentioned that it's like a smorg you try one thing you give it some time you know don't don't try to have it all at once and if it doesn't work you go to the next and you go to the next you try to see what connects to you and that was more panemius i think tonight we're going to be discussing a little bit um take it to the next level Maybe not so much panemius, it could be a little bit chitonius of Yiddishkeit. And tonight's topic is a little bit uh, sticky one, could be sticky for many. Um, for those who live in the box, for, you know, you want to open a little window to let some fresh air in. And not always is it a good idea to open somebody's eyes. You know, again, I, I don't know, I don't know where you're coming from, where you are. and But a good example is, let's say, the kids. Um, people do care sometimes. They, they say it's hard because they get to see all the types of people and we don't want them to, to be exposed. That's a good, a good uh, example that just do what I did, my father, grandfather, and that's it. No questions. That's one way of doing things. But um, eventually you get older, you want to understand a little bit. I think this Vikuach, is already an old one. Moshe Rabbeinu had this Vikuach with his shver. His shver said, and Moshe Rabbeinu said, I'm going to send my kid Mitzvah to, to Cheder, to the, the Mitzvah Shem. They're going to teach everything they have to know. 
Parishra said, no, excuse me. Um, I want them to go on the journey that I went on. I tried everything out and I got to the Akara of Hashem by myself. So they had to figure this out. I'm not sure what the Shadchan did, but they made a decision. One kid like this and one kid like that. It's, 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 a, it's a question. And uh, it's, uh, we can't really um, come to the conclusion. It, it really has to be each, each person to their own. And the truth is, Balchuvas, it's interesting. If you listen to Balchuva, sometimes they could come to a place where they connect to Yiddishkeit, where you are already, and you're looking at them and thinking, I don't know what you're talking about. It's like you grew up there and it do, you don't connect to it, even though you're talking about the same thing. For him, that connects into Yiddishkeit. I just want to share a story. It's an interesting one. Many years ago, in Eretz Yisrael, my wife, uh, we did some kirav in Mechlela Esther. And there was a girl over there um, coming back, she bought tshuva, coming back to Yiddishkeit. And it was very nice, she wanted to come for Shabbos. And she mentioned she wants to bring her friend. She had a friend, she met in Tzvas, um, her boyfriend. So we were debating and they, they, were very, they were very connected and they were growing together. And his name was Jake. So they were coming for Shabbos. And the, I found out that this boy was Yoeli from Monroe that ended up in Tzvas. And he was going to do whatever she wants because they were going to be together forever. And this was a serious question. They were really, she was growing Yiddishkeit, coming to bigger heights. And he was there, who knows how he got there. And he decided, who knows what? So we had them for Shabbos and we had Jake over there. And then in the middle of the suit, I told him, Yoli, the can't the Yiddish best of me. He's like, you know, coming from Monroe. So yeah, that's true. So again, you have different type of people coming different directions and questions what they're looking for at the end. They both went in their own way and they got the better places, uh, Baruch Hashem. But to know where we are, what connects and what works for me. And sometimes I get ideas from other places and you're not sure if it does work or not. So in Mitz Hashem tonight, we're gonna hear more from Rabbi Efren Goldberg. I believe this is how he runs his community and he's on a mission. So Mitz Hashem, we should be able to help. We should have Seattle the Shemaya. We should all hear what we need to hear to grow and become closer to Hashem. Thank you very much. For a beautiful opening. Okay, let's get into it. Um, again, just mentioning again, Menachem's still writing the first 40 shurim in short of the book. Tonight's share 78, keep that in mind. So anybody wants to be involved in any way or sponsor a, a chapter or help him write it, please email coachmenachem.gmail.com. Um, tonight's share, we're going to be something very interesting, Rabbi Goldberg. I got a request from somebody tonight. So we're going to learn to share in this, this request. Tonight's share, everybody's listening, we need everybody attention for this one. Tonight's share will be learned in schutz of a very special couple that I know well, who has not been blessed with children of their own. I am reaching out to a broad audience that will watch this to see if there's anybody out there could help them with an adoption process. Please, if anybody has any help with this, or the schutz from the share should just be a schutz for them in Shemayim, please reach out to coachmanachimajima.com and we will forward all the information to this couple and make sure we hope to hear good things. Again, after last week's conversation with Rabbi Yossi Zakatinsky, we discussed some deeper meaning in Yiddishkeit, it sort of catapulted it into this topic. So it's like a little bit like we're feeding off each other. A lot of people are talking about what the topic is, what it is, and then we stand up, I'm getting texts over here. Tonight's topic is open-mindedness open mindedness in Yiddishkeit and all different mahalchim in, in Yiddishkeit and Torah. And we have a very broad world right now, right? People getting texts from Rabbi Yossi right? The guy can live in Boca Raton, Florida, and Rabbi Yossi you get a, a WhatsApp from him and you see like, Everything is open and people are all over the place. And it's a topic that truly probably everybody in some way struggles with it. But we want to really bring it to the table tonight. We want to discuss it. It's, it's, it's an interesting topic. And we have the discuss of having uh, Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg with us tonight. So I'm going to read Rabbi Ephraim's bio. And you'll fix it up whenever I make a mistake. And then he'll go straight to the opening. Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg is a senior rabbi at Book Raton, Florida, BRS, and a rapidly growing congregation of over a thousand family with thousands of children in Boca Raton. BRS is the largest Orthodox synagogue in the Southeast United States. Rabbi Goldberg's warm and welcoming personality has helped attract diverse backgrounds and ages to feel parts of the BRS community, reinforcing 
the BRS Critigo of Valuing Diversity and Celebrating Unity. Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg, the floor is yours. Shkar, thank you so much. A good evening to everyone. And let me begin by giving a huge ashakach to you, Asher, and to Coach Menachem. I'm looking out and I see the numbers over 370 people at 10.15 on a Sunday night who are B'nai Aliyah, who are here and watching and participating live for no other reason. I hope it's not to be entertained, but to be inspired and to be informed. And uh, but that's not true tonight. You see this number and you see this crowd. It's really, it's inspiring. It's incredible what you've accomplished, what you've achieved to create this worldwide Chabura simultaneously, who are united by the desire to grow and to struggle, to confront difficult conversations, conversations that maybe make us a little uncomfortable or challenge us to leave our comfort zone and to explore a little bit more who we are. So I am very uh, indebted to you and humbled by the opportunity to share with you and uh, appreciate, appreciate this chance. Let me tell you what this is not. I want to talk to you a little bit about where I'm coming from, very personally, sort of my spiritual autobiograph, autobiography, what we try to do in our community, in our shul, in terms of its diversity, with a sense of community, all the shem shemayim, all to be marbe kvot shemayim, all to bring us closer to the Ribbon Shalom and to grow Torah. And I want to tell you what this is not. My goal tonight is if you are comfortable in your hashkafa. Now, let me, let me start out with this disclaimer. The assumption of our conversation is we're talking within the boundaries of Torah and mitzvahs and halacha. Outside of that and where you define those boundaries exactly can be complicated. We know there are debates within Hasidim. There are debates between Hasidim and Misnagdim. There are debates between Ashkenazim and Sfaradim. So we have different Hanhagas, Minhagim. We have different backgrounds and different Mesoras. But for the sake of this conversation, we're not talking about somebody who's trying to pierce or break down the barriers, the walls, the boundaries of a life of Torah and mitzvahs. The assumption is Torah's been a Shamayim, that Allah is non negotiable, that the Dal Chalke Shulchan Aruch, they are the blueprint of our lives, that we are bound by our Rebbeim and Munas Chachamim Das Torah, however you formulate it. The backdrop, the foundation, the assumption of this conversation is that we're talking about a community of people who are committed to Torah, mitzvahs, and halacha. So let me tell you what I'm not going to try to do tonight. My goal, if you are comfortable, if you come from a particular yeshiva, if you identify with a particular chasidus, if you have certain menhagim in your family, if you have a rebbe and a mesorah, my goal is not to try to convince you to leave. It's not to try to convince you to water down or dilute. It's not to try to convince you to switch teams or to pivot and to join someone else. I simply want to describe where I am and how I feel. And when I first put this out there to the greater oil, not just my shul and our community, but to the Jewish world at large, people reached out to me from all four corners of the globe to say, Yashakoch, for putting into words exactly how I feel. Thank you for making a space to describe where I am. So if you're comfortable where you are, stay there. My goal is not to convert you. My goal is not to change you. My goal is simply to generate this conversation to talk about what does it mean to be exposed to, to be aware of, to feel comfortable in a greater Torah world than when we're in? Personally, I grew up in Teaneck, New Jersey. I learned in Yeshiva Srebitzel Gachanan, Yeshiva University in YU. I'm a Talmud of Mori Varabi, of Shechter Shlita. And I'm proud of every part of those sentences. Where I learned and from whom I learned, I'm incredibly proud. I'm unapologetic. I'm not shy whatsoever. However, however, the title of this article that I wrote, which captured these feelings, was I'm not a modern Orthodox rabbi. It was a newspaper article that talked about something and referenced me, Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg, a modern Orthodox rabbi. And when I read it, I immediately recoiled. And I took exception to that description because I said, that's not the sum total of who I am. Now someone who reads that article, now someone who sees my name has these predisposed thoughts, has these associations or ideas, has locked me into that box is making all kinds of assumptions about me because they see that term, however loaded it is, whatever assumptions they have about it, and now that's what they think about me. So whether it's where I learned of the parts of so-called modern orthodoxy that I embrace fully and I'm unapologetic for, my discomfort with being called that name has nothing to do with trying to distance myself from my past. Fully embrace it, I'm fully proud of it. However, I'm bothered by the notion that that would represent the sum totality of who I am. I'm a very complex person. There are a lot of parts to who I am. I have rebellion and I have sources of inspiration and I turn to for guidance throughout the width and breadth of the Torah world. 
Ashkenazi Svardi, Hasidish, Litvish, from Lakewood to Tinek, from Eretz Yisrael to wherever. I feel connected to so many parts of the Torah world in which I've spent Shabbosim and Yom Tovim, in which I've sat in yeshivas or learned at the feet of Gedola Yisrael. And I connect to the Svarim and the Derech HaChayim and the Derech HaLimit of so many. So to isolate and to lock me and stick me into that box, to define me by only the name on my smicha is I thought to somewhat limit me. And I don't want to be limited in that way. Now, again, we have, we have Minhagim. I have minhagim from my father. We have minhagim from where we're from. I'm not encouraging anyone to abandon the minhagim, the practices that we have. Maybe we have an outlook, a perspective, a hashkafa that we grew up with. And, and there are people very comfortable in that way. So for example, you sit in shuls and you hear Chabad Rabbanim. It's very rare that you'll hear a vort, a dvar Torah, a shtikl Torah, a shir that doesn't come from the Rebbe, the Balatanya, or from the world of Chabad. I found in the Chavetz Chaim world, among Chavetz Chaim Rebbeim and even Chavetz Chaim Talmidim. They quote largely, not only, but Rebbeinach, the Rosh Hashiva. Most, almost all, Divrei Torah come through that world. And there are why you rabbis who will only quote of Soloveitchik, they'll quote Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, Sechron Levracha. There are people who are locked into that world and they think they have one shelf on their bookcase and it's a very small library. It's the library of the yeshiva they learned in or the Rebbeim they learned from. And I'm not saying that they're doing anything wrong. Those who feel that that hashkaf is the sum total of what they what does it for them and what they want to share with others, fantastic. There's so much to learn from them. However, for me, for me, I believe the Torah is so rich and it's so beautiful, it's so profound. There's so many angles, it's so nuanced, and it comes from so many different directions. And why not synthesize and why not combine and why not draw from the well, the well springs throughout the Torah world, throughout the Torah world, when. The Mincha Sasha of Asher Wai Shlita. Should have Nechama. He just uh, got up from sitting Shiva for the loss of his mother. When Rav Asher visited our community, for example, in our community, by the way, we have Russia Yeshiva from the gamut of different Yeshivas. We've had Rav Ephraim Waxman Shlita, Rav David Kohen Ligvoyevitz, and we've had Rav Shechter and my Rebbeim from Yeshiva University, and Rebbeim from Eretz Yisrael, from the total gamut, Rav Asher Weiss and others, because like my Ashkafa, I want our shul to recognize and to see and to learn from and to see the beauty of Torah. So Rav Asher said the following when he was in Boca Raton, when he was at BRS. He said, quote, he challenged us, have a litvash ahead and a chasidah shahart, the honesty, integrity of a yekka and the tamimus and purity of a Hungarian, the covet a Torah of a Svardi and the love of Eretz Yisrael of a Tzioni. Now Rav Asher Weiss was not locking anyone into stereotypes where well, you can't be honest and have integrity unless you're a yekka. You can't have covet a Torah unless you're a Svardi. Of course not. These are generalizations and stereotypes. But his point was to say that we should not delegate these parts of whether it's Midos or Ashkafa or Torah world to those segments of the Torah world. We should see ourselves as that synthesized blend of that Torah world, of drawing and incorporating and combining. So to get to the crux, here's my thesis, and then I can't wait to have this conversation. I told Asher I have until Shachras tomorrow morning as long as people want to continue the conversation. The Navi Yechezkel tells us in the Navi Yecheskel, the entrance to the Beis HaMikdash had 12 gates. The Yud Yud Beis Sha'arim to the Beis HaMikdash. And according to Rav Chaim Vital in his Priyat Chaim Sharat Fila, he says, correspondingly, each of the 12 tribes, each of the Shvatim, had their own Nusach HaTfila. Each Shevet had their own liturgy, had their own Siddur, had their own Nusach HaTfila, had their own heavenly gate. Just like in the Beis HaMikdash, each Shevet had the gate they would walk through, meaning how they accessed Yiddishkeit, what spoke to them, their hashkafa, their worldview, what they emphasized. Similarly, in Shemayim, there was a gate they go through. Each one had their own nusach. And almost 200 years later, after Chaim Vital, the Magad of Mezrich and his Magad of Yaakov in Kuf Mem Aleph added that if someone doesn't know what Shevet they come from, if someone doesn't know where they belong, what nusach to Davin, just like in the Beis HaMikdash, there was a 13th gate, so too in Shemayim, there is a 13th gate. And that's what he established, what he called the Nusach of the Ariza, the Magid called it the Shar HaKolel. The Shar HaKolel is the universal gate. A Yid, a member of Kla Yisrael, who says, I don't know what Shevet I belong to. I'm not exactly, I don't fit into that box. I'm not exactly that Shevet. I'm not exactly that Yeshiva or that community, that Yamaka, that Hashkafa, that Shita. It's not exactly me. Either I don't know where I belong or I belong in all 12 simultaneously. Such a Jew had a gate for them to walk through too. 
They had a Shara Kola, the 13th gate. They had it down here on earth in the base of Mikdash, and they had it in Shamayim, in the Nusach of the Shara Kola, the Nusach of the Ari. And what I posit, what I submit to you, my dear friends, tonight, is that what's true for Nusach is true for our lives. There are those who are confident what Shevet they come from, what Shevet they belong to. Kol HaKavod to you. Your Reuven, your Shimon, your Levi, Yehudi, Yisachar, Zvul. If you know what Shevet you come from, I don't mean the Shevet Ka. I mean, I know, you know what Shevet you come from. I'm a Litvasha, I'm a Chassidusha. I'm this type of Chassidusha, not that Chassidusha. I'm in this yeshiva, I'm not interested in any other yeshiva. If you know what Shevet you're from, Tava Allah Bracha. Belong to it. Live it. Be comfortable in it. Enjoy it. But there are many of us. I could tell you personally, myself, over my life, when I was a Talmud in Yeshiva University, I spent Shabbosim in New Square by the Square Rebbe. I went three years in a row for Simchas Torah to New Square. I felt a pull. I felt a connection. It provided something for me that I wasn't getting, that I wasn't being inspired by in my Yeshiva from my Rebbeim. Not any fault or deficiency of their own, but there are different Shvatim. And so I see myself as a member of that Shara Kolel. I see myself walking through that 13th gate, feeling comfortable drawing from the different gates around us. And my friends, I don't think I'm the only one. I imagine many of you here tonight and many of people you know, they may wear a certain yarmulke or they may cover their head in a certain style. They may send their kids to a certain school. They may fit into a certain mold the way society wants to label us because it's convenient for society to say, you're this, that, or the other thing. You know, on the dating websites today, you fill in on the dating website. What are you? Are you modern Orthodox, right-wing modern Orthodox, right-wing Chabad? The, the dating sites try to lock you into that hashkafa. But I think there are many who look at that drop-down menu and say, I don't know what to answer because I'm a little bit of each. I'm a little bit of them all. I take from it all. I walk through that Shara Kolo. I feel connected to so many parts of Klal Yisrael. And I know this to be a fact. The empirical evidence is undeniable. Because there are people in Lakewood. I know that Yeshiva University has an incredible Torah site called YU Torah. And when they crunch their data every year, the IP addresses that are consuming countless hours of the YU Rashi Yeshiva and the Torah of YU Musmachim is Lakewood, New Jersey. And if you go to Yeshiva University in Washington Heights and those who identify are Musmachim of YU, how many of them have a Yerach Lamadim on their shelf? How many are watching the Rebbeilach Biederman? How many are learning the Svarim of Richard Meyer Morgenstern? How many are connecting to other parts of the Torah world? The walls have come crumbling down and the global from Torah community has access to one another. And we are learning Svarim and listening and watching whether one minute video clips or the full shurim. We're able to see and we're able to learn. Mishpacha Magazine, Ami Magazine, Hamodia, they are exposés. They're giving profiles on the totality of the Torah world. And whereas in the past, a person was locked in and you didn't read and you weren't exposed to and you knew nothing about someone from another world. Today, the cover of those magazines could be a Rosh Hashiva of Lakewood or YU from Eretz Israel or America, Asfari and Ashkenazi, a Hasidah or Litvisha. The worlds have come crumbling down. I had a Rebbe in Eretz Israel and Karen Biyab and Rabbi Lachman who used to say, he used to say, you can put me in a box when I'm dead. Until then, don't try to make me feel, fit me into one of your labels. You'll put me in a box when I'm dead. Until then, don't try to label me because it'll be more comfortable for you. We're living in a time that it's more comfortable. People want to label one another. I, I need to know how to see you. I want to know how to judge you. I need to know how to evaluate you. Are you one of mine or are you the other? Where do you fit in? By the way, when such a person meets someone who's complicated, complex, nuanced, it throws them for an enormous loop. They don't know what to do with them. I don't know where to put you. You're a Tamil Chacham, you have your Shemayim, but you also are connected to that. You, you're knowledgeable and you're exposed to this, but you also, they don't know what to do with it. They don't know what to do with it. And so if other people feel comfortable in this world, that is my thesis. That is a description of who I am and where I am in my life. And I could give you many more examples of trying to drink from the wellsprings of Torah, of the Shivim Panamla Torah, the diversity of Torah. But there's a lot of uh, opportunity for conversation. Hashem, in that context, I'm happy to share a lot more of. Why do I believe in this? Why do I believe it's okay to believe in this? What are the makoras? What are the sources that a Jew is allowed to see themselves in the Shara Kolo? That you don't have to work tirelessly to belong to only one shade and lock yourself in. Why are you allowed to? Again, all within the framework of a Torah world, not breaking through barriers outside of Torah. The assumption of this whole conversation, Torah, mitzvos, halacha is binding, non-negotiable.
All right, Ephraim, beautiful opening. Let's get into it. Okay, we're going to take a little poll. We can take a minute break. Rabbi Goldberg, I know you start off with the passion. Let's, let's go. Take a drink. Here we go. Amen. Okay, we're going to ask everybody this poll. Everybody, you see it on the screen. Just two questions. Answer from your heart anonymously, and let's just get a feeling from the crowd. How do you feel about your Ashkafa that you were brought up with? Do you feel A, stifled and looking for more depth? Option B, it's a perfect fit for you. Option C, I wish I can get out, but it's easier to stay as, as in, as is. That's the first question. The second question, what is keeping me from exploring other Ashkafa Torah views? A, I don't trust myself. B, others will judge me. Or C, I don't know where to start. So those are two questions. Everybody answer. We'll give you five seconds, and then we'll jump into questions. Person here. Okay, let's share the poll with everybody. Then we'll jump into questions. Here we go. How do you feel about your Ashkafa that you were brought up with? 37% of people say over here that they're stifled and looking for more depth. 37% of people. 50% of people are, it's a perfect fit. They're happy where they are and they're good. They just came here, Rabbi, Rabbi Goldberg, just to see you because they love you. And 30% of people, I wish I can get out, but it's easier for me to stay where I am. Number two, what is keeping me from exploring other Ashkafas? 10% of people say I don't trust myself. 35% of people say others will judge me. And 56% of people say, I don't know where to start. Okay, let's X this out. Okay. Okay. Let's start with the first live question, and then we will let the night go. Everybody, it was Chusav Ephraim here from Boca Raton, Florida. If anybody has a question that they want to ask, please, he's here to answer. Go. First of all, thank you so much for the introduction. And I really enjoy your living with the new series that I follow from New York. And I wanted to ask, so how does one gain confidence to do what is right, despite what others could say, or even not say, but might feel the vibes that they think that what you're doing is not correct? Because the world that we live in is such a superficial world and focuses so much on the outside, but there are so many different ways to acquire a relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. That's a great question. You heard the question clearly? I think I heard the question clearly, which is that it's a very superficial world. It's a judgmental world. And uh, how can a person know what to do or where to go or what to look or how to open themselves up to other opportunities? Because uh, there's a fear. There's a fear. First of all, there's a fear people don't trust themselves. And there's a fear that um, there's a fear that others will judge us. It could impact our children. Shaduchim. It could impact whether they get into the yeshivas or seminaries. It could impact so many things. So we're living in that position of fear. So it's a fantastic question. So let me say this. First of all, the Rebona Shalom made you a Tzalem Elohim. He gave you an intuition and an instinct. He gave you an intellect and he gave you a curiosity. And he wants you to go discover him. Avram Avinu found the Rebona Shalom. We are the Talmidim of Avram Avinu. We are the progeny, the children of Avram Avinu. And we're also on a journey of finding ourselves. Machova Sa'adam Ba'olam of the Mesil Sharon begins. A person should ask himself, what is my duty? What is my obligation? Where is my place in the world to be Makiris Makomo? Who am I and what is my place and what difference am I made to, meant to make? So the fish, superficial world we look, live in, it tries to fit us in these narrow box. And then we end up competing with one another. We end up trying to, um, trying to imitate one another. But our mission is to be who we are and who we're meant to be. And who we are, who we're meant to be includes a process of a journey of discovery. That's the Lech Lech of Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu is Lech Lecha. Go and find you. There wasn't a destination that was offered. There were no coordinates. There was nothing to plug into ways of the GPS. The lech was to go where? Lecha. Salaam Rabbi Nassim Shalom says that a person who tries to live the life of another person, they say, I'm going to imitate you. I'm going to compete with you. I want to look like you, act like you. I'll have the same job as you. I'll sit in the same committees as you. I'll keep the same hours in the base medrash as you. I'm going to be exactly like you. That's Salaam Rabbi says, that is the definition of avoda zara. It's avoda. My avoda to Hashem is zara. It's foreign to me. It's not me. It's not who I meant to be. So the lech lecha, to be on a journey of discovery. Now, again, what I'm saying is not so radical at all. I'm not suggesting switch the type of yarmulke, switch the type of hair covering, switch your children's school, yeshiva. I'm not suggesting radical shifts or changes from where we come from. If a person is comfortable where they come from, if a person is proud, if a person feels inspired, if a person is living a rich Jewish life, then be happy. My point is 
that there shouldn't have the fear to also be exposed to what else is out there. And we have the gift right now of technology. Now, I might've been afraid to say that, particularly, let's say to a, a Lakewood Hevra, except that you're all on Zoom right now. Hevra, let's be honest with one another. If you're here right now and you're listening, whether on Zoom or later on YouTube or podcast or whatever device or platform you're listening on, to whatever degree you are embracing technology. You might even be part of a community that tells you that's also in Treif and Forbidden and Yarev Yavor, but you're here anyway because you're craving, you're hungry, you're searching, you're looking, you're a Ben or a Bas Aliyah, you want to grow, you want to find, you want to discover. So my answer is that without taking enormous risk, without risking the Shaduchim of our children, without risking our children getting into these schools, the yeshivas of their choice, a person can grow and learn, whether it's on other platforms or devices like this, to listen, to read, to learn, to be inspired, to experience other segments of the community. You know, when the members of our community go to Israel after high school for a year, and they ask me, when they say, what should I, what's the most important thing? What do you recommend? What do I need to experience in that year? I say to them, of course, aside from drawing out everything you can from the yeshiva, the seminary that you're in, taking every class and sitting at the feet of every great person and learning every moment. And aside from going to the holy sites of Eretz Yisrael, I always say, try to make the rounds in Eretz Yisrael among diverse communities. Don't just go to your aunt where has a new American kitchen. Don't go to your cousin where it's comfortable, the food's good and it's American bed. Don't just go where you know and where you're comfortable. Eretz Yisrael has a rich tapestry, a beautiful diversity of Torah communities, of Torah communities. I mentioned Mori Varabi Rav Asher Weiss. Rav Asher Weiss is a Kleisenberger chassid. He is an undisputed, one of the major poskim, a Godel be Yisrael. Rav Asher, I think, is somebody who every community recognizes his godless betorah. But Rav Asher, do you know where Rav Asher gives shir every week or every month in Eretz Yisrael? Aside from the shirim he gives in his yeshivas and his kololim, he goes to the Hezda yeshiva and stay wrote. He's spoken in the Hezda Yeshiva in Gush Etzion, in Karen Biavna. He makes the rounds because he says, if people are thirsty for Torah, I'll go there to share it as long as they're part of the Olam HaTorah, as long as they're part of the, the legitimate world of Torah. And so if he's not afraid to go to the different diverse worlds to teach Torah, then why are we afraid to be exposed to the diverse worlds to learn Torah? I'm not talking about outside those worlds, but within the worlds of the Olam HaTorah that can work together. Why are we afraid? So don't worry about your neighbor and don't worry my Yomru what they're going to say about you. Privately, privately, slowly, incrementally, a little bit to experience. And I'll tell you why I think it's very important. And I want to clarify this one, Nakuda, and I know there are a lot of questions. We'll get to other questions. But when you have a Rav on, you can't begin to think that any answer is going to be short. So I don't feel that bad. I want to clarify something. I'm not suggesting if you know what shavit you belong to, you have to switch to the Shara Kolo. But I am suggesting that you not lock yourself into one shevet, la'afuke, to the exclusion of every other shevet, of all the rest of the shvatim, to pass all the other shvatim out there. And I'll tell you why. If not for you, because you're comfortable, for your children and for our grandchildren, I'm telling you because I see the horror stories of what happens. Boca del Rey is the capital of the world of addiction and recovery. And I see people that come from very, very firm communities. And I'm not blaming parents and I'm not blaming addiction specifically on this issue alone. But in almost every conversation you have with people who come from incredibly intense firm upbringings, who've walked away, they'll tell you that the world I was in was so narrow and it was so suffocating and it was so small and it was so judgmental that if I didn't fit exactly, and if I had any curiosity, and if I challenged with any question, there was no room for me. I was a shegetz, I was a guy. And you know what? If I'm a shegetz and a guy, I might as well live like a shegetz and a guy. And that's why very often the people who go off the derech in that community, they don't end up somewhere else with their Shomer Torah and mitzvahs, but in a different Ashkafa. They walk away entirely because they've been told, our shegetz the only shevet. There's no shifteko, there's no sharakolo. This is it. This is the only way to live, to learn Torah. These are the only Hanagos, the only Ashkafa, these are the only Menagam. This is it. And if you deviate in Iota, if you ask one question, there's no room for you. It's either our way or you're a guy. So I might as well go live and I might as well go be a guy. I see those horror stories. I see that pain. I see the results of that narrowness. So I'm not saying anyone should leave their shavit and join the Shara Kolo. I'm saying that perhaps, perhaps, if we proudly wave the banner of our shavit 
and we proudly teach and inculcate the background of our Sheva to our children, but we also teach them that we live in this global open world in which I don't care where you come from, there's opportunity to be exposed to diversity and to other things out there that if we, if we can appreciate and teach a respect and an openness within the Olam Torah, again, we're talking only within the diverse Olam Torah, I think we'll keep more of our children within the firm world because they won't get squeezed and pushed out by the narrowness that makes no room for them to go. Beautiful, Rabbi Goldberg. Beautiful. Okay, let's go to the next li- live question you're on. All right. So, number one, um, this is Yitzchak. I just want to thank you for all the help that you've done um, for Kotor Kula in particular, which is the organization I am involved in. Uh, but my question is essentially, um, I come from a very open-minded family where it happens to be my mom comes from Tinak, more of a stern background than my father more of a Chavitz Chaim guy. So we always had diversity in the house. But as the community I live in is becoming more and more rigid, I'm getting more and more judgment for not necessarily wearing a hat every single day and, um, you know, not wearing a hat and jacket. I have my reasons for it. Um, I, I dive in three times a day. I keep Shabbos. And there are certain things that I'm just getting judged by. And when I went to the Ralph and my chauffeur guidance, he's like, well, maybe you should try to fit in more. And I honestly want to do what is comfortable for me. Um, And I am a very open-minded individual, and I don't judge others who do feel what they do, what is right for them. But I guess coming from that open-minded society, my question is essentially a person who is being called modern and a Sioni whether that's true or not, in that society, what can I do, and I'm sure there are other people like this as well, um, to make things, I would say, a little better? Yes, I think it's a great question. First of all, it's great to see you. Thank you all the work you do for Torah Kola Torah Kula. And everybody here should know Yitzchak. He's uh, one of my heroes. It's really an amazing story of, of uh, what you do to spread Torah in the world. So Yitzchak, it's a great question, and it relates to the last question. Because for whatever reason, you're not comfortable right now wearing a hat. Does that mean you're not an Eved Hashem? You don't have your Shemayim? You're not a Ben Torah? Does that mean that you don't have a place? There are a lot of people who wear hats whose Yer Shemayim doesn't come close to measuring up to yours, whose Talmud Torah and spreading of Torah doesn't come close to matching up of yours. These are superficial criteria. Happens to be, well, I wear a hat seven days a week. I wear a hat. So I'm not knocking or ranking a hat. I wear a hat. But is the hat the sum total of who we are? Does that become the tool, the instrument, the weapon through which we are going to judge or beat or feel holier than thou from others. So I think a person has to have a Rebbe, Yitzchak, I know you have Rebbeim, and you have a Rebbe that you have to ask. People have to ask their questions to. We have to seek out Amunas Chacham or Midas Torah, whatever terminology you want to employ. But we have people, Marbe Itza Marbe Tzfuna. We speak to the role models, the sources of inspiration, the guidance, and the authorities of our life. And we come to the conclusions of who we want to be and how we want to live. And so there are different communities that have different minhagim, and there's nothing wrong with that. And we have to respect that. It's a din in Hilchos Sneas. Hilchos Sneas has objective absolute standards. They are the halacha that's non-negotiable. But then built in, caked into the dinim of Hilchos Sneas is that when you're in a community that has more strict definitions or practices of Sneas, you have a responsibility and obligation to respect them. So you don't walk in and flout and say, you know what, but I don't keep that. And it's not the strict halacha. So who are you to tell me I have to? No, that's the halacha. So there's a notion that we respect the community that we're visiting, or we respect the community that we're living in. But at the same token, when we're making the personal decision for ourselves in whatever community we're going to be, we should have some self-confidence. We should have some belief in ourselves, and we should seek the sources of inspiration and guidance around us. And once they've weighed in, to be confident in the conclusion that we reach, proud of who we are, and live our best to be a Ben or Basalia, to live and to grow the most that we can. Okay, Brother Goldberg, let's get into some questions over here people sent in, and we still have a lot live. We're going to try to cover as much as possible, okay? Absolutely. Let's start with this. Um, we, belong to, we belong to a certain Hasidus. I'm very happy. However, one of my kids is struggling with this particular community. He's not rebellious. He's a from kid, but it's not acceptable to do things differently here. How do I deal with this with him? And with the community. 
It's a great question. That's a question that's not even necessarily about the Shara Kolal in particular. It's a question about parenting, and it's a question about not outreach, but inreach, retention. How do we take our children who maybe don't feel exactly that they belong in that box because it's so small and narrow? And, and how do we I want to clarify? I just want to clarify. We're talking about a kid that, let's say, is yeah. and now he's more, wants to be like this, or a kid is more litfish, and now he's becoming breast love. He's just going into different, not, not from. I understand that. Or within from, cat. He's remaining from. from cat, right. So again, my experience and what my Rebbeim have taught me is all you do is shower that child with love. The child, Shomer Torah Mitzvos, but that Ashkafa or that practice doesn't speak to them. So what's the alternative? To stifle them, suffocate them, keep them in until they're miserable, till you drive them away from Frumkite altogether, or to recognize they want to stay from. So it's not their way. So it's not their way. I have Mishpach in Lakewood. And we know that the... the Old school, base medrash gavoa, learning, Talmud Torah, can I get kulam? And they have a child who became a chassid, and they shower him with love. It's beautiful. He's Shomer Torah mitzvahs. He learns Torah. He's kavitim the Torah. What's there to be? This is where we should be uh, upset. This is where we should be um, disappointed. I, I think that there's no alternative but to shower them with love. You know, we're not in the ghetto anymore. Klai Yisrael once lived in ghettos, and there was a certain, whether it was forced from the outside because the secular world didn't uh, welcome us in, or whether we created a structure that was insular, that kept people in. But once upon a time, we were able to keep everybody in check. I'm not even sure that's true, but we like to live in the world of make-believe that once upon a time we could. And in that world, a child went off the derech, a child intermarried, we tore Korea, we sat Shiva, but the world has changed. The world has changed radically. The world is open. It's wide open. It is inviting. And there are opportunities to be exposed, to learn, to practice, to see, to be. And we have to pivot. We have to shift in our expectations and the feedback that we give. So we should have expectations of our children. We should want them to be the most that they could be in Torah way. But we should be proud. Yaakov Avinu wasn't proud that he was the father of the Shift Eikah, the 12 Shvatim. They weren't all cookie cutter. They didn't all exactly resemble him. They were different. They were different. And yet he was equally proud of them all because he, rep, he, he respected that they were different shvatim, the different shvatim themselves and the shara kolal of the one who walks through the last. So I think that if a child is remaining from and stark, there's going to be shomer Torah and mitzvahs, but who wants to change their hashkafic orientation, that Hasidus speaks to them. Hasidus speaks to them. By the way, we have a world and a rich history of, of great Hasidus Rebbes who didn't come from the world of Hasidus. And then they went for a Shabbos and they said, one speaks to my head, he speaks to my heart. We know all these stories. And so I don't think there's anything wrong. I think they need to be showered with love and they need to be showered with support. They should be showered with respect and there should be conversation. There should be conversation to be able to navigate. If there are differences, how are they navigating? There's a fear. The parents have a fear that if he does, he wants to change. You're saying he's going to stay that way, but maybe he's starting to um, let go of everything else. So again, I don't know the specific question, but you have a kid who says change. That's what everybody's scared of. Whichever, if you come more Hasidish, some people are scared of that also. More Litvish, uh, uh, he's taking off his hat and now he's taking off his jacket and who knows where, where it's going. So there's a fear of that parent of not being able to say what you're saying, to shower with love, do whatever you want. But what's the alternative? And the alternative is to do what? What's the alternative? That parent comes to you and they say, my child... They don't always want to learn night seder. There's a chassid shereb. There's a tish they want to go to. There's a fabreng they want to sit into. And you're going to say what? Talmud Torah, can I get kulam? Can you sit in the Torah? No, you can't go to the tish. You can't go to the fabreng. You can't go sit. The, no, Bittle you have to go to the best Bittle Bittle What? Bittle Torah. Good. So you're going to teach them Bittle Torah. They don't say I want to go to the movies and I want to go to the game and I want to go to the. They're saying I want to go to fabreng and I want to go to a tish. I want to experience a different something speaks to my neshama differently. Bundle. What's the alternative? What are you telling them? Before you eliminate my way, what's the alternative? There's the alternative. What's the alternative? You say it's beautiful. You're Neshama, you're from, it's, 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 you're a Ben Aliyah that night. It's inspiring you. Fantastic. Tomorrow morning, we resume morning Seder. That's it. What's the alternative? Rabbi, Rabbi Goldberg, let's go right there. Okay, Joseph, let's go. Uh, good evening, Rabbi Goldberg. Um, I am a foreigner. I've been here for five years. Uh, I mean, 20 years. Um, I've tried many times to contact you and never been able to get through. So if this question is somewhat controversial, then I apologize. My, my point is as follows, that Hashkofa 
drives halacha. Unfortunately, I've been involved in uh, a very difficult divorce. And why am I raising this point? Because the Beth Din of America refuses to ever put into serov a woman who's gone to our kois, whereas in other communities, they follow the halacha. And that, to me, is a serious problem when Rabbonim in the modern Orthodox community are always siding with the woman, no matter how many virus of our kois, of Masira, the chulu they do. Whereas at least in the more yeshivish community, you find pockets that are open-minded. And let me expound on this a little bit more. This is not only just involving Masira and our kois. It's involving breaking families, parental alienation, and when just, men just, refuse... Just, just, to, cut you off, let one, me just finish. I'll be one, one second, more second. One second. One second. When one men second. refuse to give getting because their wives have violated halacha and, and, um, and, and been involved in such serious parental alienation, and the modern Orthodox community always sides with the woman, always puts a serif on the man. The best thing of America has never put a serif on a, on a woman. Then for you to make this kind of general statement that we should all be in one big tent, I have serious issues with. You started off by saying... Okay, Rabbi Goldberg. Yeah, Joseph, let me, let, uh, let me respond in one sentence, Usher, if it's okay. Yeah. First of all, Joseph, I'm so sorry for your pain. I, I hear that there's enormous pain from your experience, and I'm terribly sorry for it. This could be the first time in history that the modern Orthodox world was called, called closed-minded and the yeshivish world was called open-minded. I don't speak for the modern Orthodox world. I don't speak for the basin of America. I don't speak for your particular incident. All I'll tell you is this. You could find online, because I do try to fight for agunas, and I do try to advocate, and I do try to stand up. Every single time I've spoken about that subject, online or offline, and you can test me, I always say it's not always the woman who's in innocent and the man is the perpetrator. I've been involved in cases where the woman is practicing parental alienation, where the woman is manipulative, where the woman is exploiting, and the husband is the victim who deserves our support. Every single time I say that disclaimer, and that's the way I personally have tried to practice, I can only speak for myself. I don't represent and can't speak for others, but I feel your pain and I'm so sorry for it. There's an interesting question that came in. I was born in the ultra Hasidic family from Kyrgyz While I was growing up, it worked, but was very hard. Now Barakshan I'm married and decided to live in a more out-of-town, relaxed lifestyle. I'm getting a lot of negative feedback and as if I'm in a bad heat, when re in reality, I didn't choose to be brought up the way I was, and I'm 100% from, and I go to Shurim, and what, what could I do about this? The, the questioner is asking, what can I do about this to do what? To feel good about myself, to be able to go to shot, to go for Pesach with my family, and not to feel like a uh, Oisvarf. What, what's what's the question? He needs physic and how to talk to his family. Right. So so you understand the nakuda there is that what sounds like from the question. Again, if a person says, "I grew up, I was raised from," but it's too intense, it's too suffocating. So I don't want to really always keep Shabbos or keep kosher. I want to walk away. And help me feel that I fit into the Shara Kola. I want to be very clear, as clear as Usher might be clear. That is not what we're talking about tonight. This is an individual, Coach Menachem, the way you phrase the question. The individual says, I'm still from. I lived in a community that had a certain mode of dress, a community that had certain culture, a community that had certain assumptions and expectations. And I've pivoted outside that community, but I remain from. That's the question, right? So essentially what the person is saying is, I've discovered what's working for me in my relationship with the Ribbon Shalom. However, I'm being made to feel inferior. I'm being made to feel judged by others because I trimmed or because I dress or because I do differently. Still from Kaveit and I go to Shir, my daven with a minion, I keep Allah, you can eat in my home. So the issue here is not the person. They're comfortable and they found what's working for them. The issue, unfortunately, are others and a world that says this shave it and this shave it only. And you're moved to the Shara Kolel. You're trying to live and draw from others. We're going to sit in judgment of you. We're going to marginalize you. We're going to make you feel inferior and bad about yourself. 
I don't think the problem in that question is with the one asking the question. The problem is with the other people in their life who are making them feel that way. I'll tell you something about our community. Again, some would describe or define our community as a modern Orthodox community. And in some ways that's legitimate. There are aspects of our community that are modern Orthodox, even though the fastest growing segment of our community would not be labeled from that world. We have more shiurim and more dafyomis and more minyanim and more learning and more chesed. I'm incredibly proud of what we have and what's going on. And the world is moving towards us in shul and Shabbos, more shtraimlach, chasidim who are comfortable, Lakewood people who are buying places down here. And there's an enormous diversity. I say in our shul on a Shabbos morning, you have a guy in a Strymel sitting next to someone who drove to shul that Shabbos morning, their first time in an Orthodox shul. Bili Guzma, that is not an exaggeration. You can have that in our shul. Now, you might have that in other communities. The Chiddush of our shul is that, I would say by the end of davening, but hopefully they're not talking during davening. After davening, they didn't just sit next to one another. They've actually developed a relationship and a friendship. Shabbos morning in our shul, we have nine minyanim. Nine minyanim. We have a Nates minion and we have a Ashkama minion. And we have a base Medrash minion. We have a Nusach Sfard minion, a main minion, a Nusach Ari minion, a Dutta Mizrach minion, a teen minion, an outreach minion, nine minyanim Shabbos morning at BRS. Nine minyanim. If you can't find a place you can feel comfortable, but either you want something large, you want something small, you want something quick, you want something slow, you want they sing a lot, you want they don't sing at all, you want a sit up, sit down kiddush, a stand up kiddush, no kiddush, you want a chabur afterwards, you want to sit down and have a tish afterwards, whatever nusach that you want, Baruch Hashem, we're trying to provide, and we have. And do you know how many chever there are who moved? Exactly, Coach Menachem, your question. I came from such and such a community. I looked a certain way. I didn't feel comfortable. I didn't belong. I wasn't comfortable in my own skin. I didn't meet the standards. And I, lo- I, I left part of it. And I can't tell you how many people in our community, because of the diversity and the respect that you don't have to fit in a box, that there are different ways and paths and different entrances to be able to come close to Kodesh Baruch Hu, because that judgment, the, the aura and the environment of judgment was lifted from them, they're finally able to pursue Torah, not from a sense of guilt and not from a sense of pressure and not from a place of fear, but part of their own journey of Lech Lecha and are learning more and observing more than they ever were when they came from whatever community they moved from that the world might judge and say was a firmer community. So I think that it's not only for those who are craving it, such as myself, and many others who've described that they feel comfortable, they want to belong, they want to live in that Shara Kolo. But I think that when we claw Yisrael, the more we promote that there's a sense of diversity, that there are different paths, the Shivan Panam La Torah, the more we make space and we make room within the halachic framework, the more we'll keep everyone within halacha. And the more narrow we make it and the more judgmental it is, those who don't feel they fit and belong will simply dismiss, throw off the yoke and run away. And therefore, I think we're doing not only ourselves a service, but the future and the continuity of a total community a great service. Beautiful, Rabbi Goldberg. You're on. Hi. Hi. I'm listening to you. I've been enjoying your, you know, your, your talk. Um, I, I get the sense that it's geared toward people from, from birth. Now, as a, I don't speak for all Bali Chuba, but I do. I sort of did have the problem that a little handicap that I'm, I just have orphaned, so to speak. I don't come with a Masora. My family was very secular, right? So it was important to me. I mean, I sort of did the Shabbos gypsy thing initially. I explored different communities, but I felt that it was important to have one, you know, as much as I, I work in the mainstream and everything and I enjoy seeing all kinds of Jews, but I think that, or wouldn't you say at least for Balchu, they should have a, a specific community uh, you know, I said, I'll tell you, I joined I'm with Chabad, it's, but not just because I, I like Hasidus, I feel that at least it had a certain communal feel. I think, I mean, would you recommend, I mean, would you say that a Baltuba would need more a specific community? Um, you know, you know, you know shuls, there are plenty of shuls around, but one that really would give you, a, you know, I guess a sense of roots or, or you know, you know, growth because again i don't have the advantage of a masora you know right. aunts uncles nieces to you know just fall back on in terms of you know learning different observances and you know i always admired the self-assurance of these people who grew up that way right but, no I, I appreciate it first of all it's a great question although you should probably turn this off and you should be watching the kenneth Shluchim tonight if mm-hmm. you're uh if you're in chabad i'm just joking if you're in chabad uh, it, it's a great great question and i would say the following you, you're I right Goldberg, I she's open-minded 
She's open minded. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. I, I would say this. I would say that many Bali Tshuva, first of all, have an advantage. You don't also have, have necessarily the hangups about from kite uh, that, that those who are from from birth have. You come maybe with a cleaner slate. So there are disadvantages, but there are also some advantages. Aside from the fact that Chazal say, that where you stand and what you've achieved and what you've accomplished by making this great step in your life is something that those who are born righteous can't ever compare or compete. So kola kavod, really tremendous, tremendous thing. But very often about Shuva, whoever was makari of them, whatever excited them, whatever turned them on, however they found entree into the Jewish people is the shay that they belong to. So many belong to Chabad, many belong to Eish Torah or Sameach, MJE, Ner La'el, the list goes on and on. That whatever Shevet was the one that first inspired, that's the Shevet they belong to. But I'll say here also, this vision or this thesis of Ashara Kolel, of exposing to the width and breadth of what I'm going to, in a moment, talk about as being Hashem Berach as Avram Bakol, a philosophy of Bakol, the synthesis of the Torah world of what's out there, I think is critically important for Balei Tshuva too. We had in our community many years ago, somebody who became religious became from through Chabad. They were a very high profile, a very famous person because of certain accomplishment and achievement in their life and their previous career. And they, hook, line, and sinker were inspired by Chabad. I love Chabad. Everybody knows how much I love Chabad. We have a Nusach Minyan in our shul and I feel very connected, very inspired. I'm in awe of what Chabad does. So this is not a criticism of Chabad. But Chabad is a place that's very narrow. It's one shevet that is very, very, it's its way. And this individual became from through Chabad and didn't touch his beard. He grew his beard long to the floor. And he went around speaking and inspiring. And he was living the Chabad life. But you know what? He skipped steps. He was embracing some of the superficial parts of living an observant Chabad life without having filled in the gaps with Torah learning and with knowledge and with other, and he wasn't exposed that this isn't the only way that there are other practices, other minhagim, other viewpoints, other ashkafas. And you know what ended up happening? When, when, because he skipped those steps and the foundation was so weak, the building came crumbling down. And for the time being, we hope and we dive in that he'll come back. For the time being, he's no longer observant because his whole draw to Frumkite and his whole window into Frumkite was so narrow as about tshuva that when he woke up and realized why do I look like this and act like this and do these things? I don't even know exactly why I'm doing it. I don't remember making the decision to do it. And I was just doing it because of the pressure to fill in and do it. And I don't know that there's any other way to do it. So if it's either that or nothing, he returned to a life of nothing. So I think even within the Bali Tshuva world to expose and to inspire and to encourage and to promote that there's Shivan Panama Torah, there's 70 faces of Torah. And these are not, I, I could quote, Again, I don't know how much time we have. I can quote countless Makoras to you right now about the Shivan Panama Torah and about Elo Elo Divir Kim Chaim is not only an idea in Halacha, Elo Elo Divir Kim Chaim is an idea in Ashkafa. And Elo Elo Kim Chaim is not only an idea in Ashkafa. I read to you. Can I, can I pause you for one second? I yeah. Something. A lot of people like when you say something, they give a text like, oh, why is he talking bad about Chabad? Why talking about this? Can you clarify that we're not talking bad about any Lakewood, Chabad? Chalila, Chalila. We're talking in general. Clarify that again, because I think people sometimes when they hear their thing, they're shavit, they're very sensitive, they're hypersensitive, they're Correct. They have sh- and they get very Correct. nervous. So let's <laughs> clarify that and then move on because I want to, I think people like get, they don't realize how sensitive they are. You 100%. Said, oh, an amazing Hasidus, you love Chabad, I'm Chabad, I love Chabad. Chabad's Everybody's defensive, everybody's defensive for their shavit. Can you just clarify that one and then go into the prayers? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Everybody's defensive and they should be. We're proud and we're protective of our shavit and we should be. And nobody should badmouth or judge or feel uh, superior to any particular shevet. So as long as the shvatim are within the rubric, under the umbrella, they're part of the world of the Olam Torah, then nobody should be critical of, of the other. So I wasn't saying it as a criticism of Chabad or of their methodology of Kirov. My point is simply that for the Baal Tshuva on the journey themselves, I think it's healthy to be exposed to and to learn. And even us within trying to be Makariv, as we're bringing people in, expose them and teach them and show them the beautiful Olam Torah, not knowing what will speak to whom when, so that maybe when one thing feels a little weak and it's no longer speaking, something else will resonate and it will still go far. So we have Makoros, again, there are countless Makoros, but there are Makoros to this notion that there isn't one authoritative, there isn't one correct, there isn't one categorically uh, imposed hashkafa for all, the Shvatim, one Shevet, 
We have the idea that these and those are the words of a living God applies not only to halacha, it applies to hashkafa. In some ways, it applies even more in hashkafa. The Rambam in his parish of Mishnayis in three places, Mesecha Sota, the third parak, Shavu is the first parak, and he writes it in Mitzvah Losa, in Mitzvah Losa, say Kuflam and Gimel. The Rambam writes it in several places. He says, there is no notion of a psak halacha in Ashkafa. This is the sheet of the Rambam. It's a machlokas, not everybody agrees. Again, there's a lot to discuss, there are a lot of makos. But the Rambam, in three places in Perish Mishnais, the Rambam in several places says that when it comes to a dispute in halacha, I need to know in Dine Borer, do I follow the Chazanish or do I follow the Moshe? I want to know in laws of brain death, do I follow this posik or that posik? I want to know in kashras, do I keep this standard or that standard? When it comes to ultimately our observance of halacha, harav, we need a posik, we need to be consistent within our psak to turn to a posik. Psak applies to the world of halacha. But the Rambam is clear that when it comes to the world of hashkafa, when it comes to how I see the world, how I experience the world, when it comes to the totality of the rich beauty and tapestry and diversity of the Torah world, the Rambam writes, when it's not tachlisa maisam in amasim, when it's not an actionable item, when it's not a psak in halacha in practice, but it's a question of my worldview, then ein lomar shem halacha kaploni. You don't say that halacha follows one opinion. We do not follow the rules of psak. When it comes to Ashkafa, we have options. Ironically, I quote my Rebbe, he quotes his Rebbe, the Shechter quotes from Soloveitchik and from the Brisker Derech that there's no such thing as Hashkafa different than Halacha. Every Hashkafa is a Halachic Shaila, so just like Psak applies to Halacha, it applies to Hashkafa. So my own Rebbe wouldn't necessarily say this or say this in this way. But the point is, the point is that when it comes to Hashkafa, you don't have to have a Psak. You're able to say, you know, there's a piece of Rav Kook that speaks to me, but there's also a piece of the Satmar Rebbe that speaks to me. You can learn the Divrei Yon, you can understand there's a piece of what the Satmar Rebbe says about Israel that speaks to me. And there's a piece of what Rav Kook writes about Israel that speaks to me. And there's a piece of, because in Hashkafa, one doesn't have to lock themselves. So you'll say, I don't understand. You'll say, Coach Menachem looks like he's about to say, it's a stira in Bay. What do you mean? How could you hold like Rav Kook and the Satmar Rebbe? How could you hold this Ashkafa and that Ashkafa simultaneously? You're going to say on my wall in my office, there's a beautiful Jew who lives in Boca Raton who collects Kisveyad. He's got a thousand Kisveyad going back to Bikiv Eger, the Chassam Sofer, incredible original handwritten letters, manuscripts, amazing Kisveyad. So this beautiful Jew lent me from my office several Gedol Yisrael, beautifully framed their picture and Kisveyad. Ivor Chaim is a Grzynski, and Salavechik, and Rabbi Yosef, and Shimon Shkop. And Schwab and beautiful, they're, they're in my office with letters, original letters they've written, Kisveyad framed. So on my wall, side by side, I have Lubavitcher Rebbe and Rav Shach, side by side, side by side. I hope in the Olam Emes somehow that Machlokas Hashem Shemaim has figured itself out. So how could it be? I hold both of the Rebbe and Rav Shach. I turn to both of them for Torah. I learn both of their Torah. Yeah, how could it be? It's a stira in Bay. How could it be? How could it be? I could live in the Shara Kolo. When the two shvatim, when the two tribes, and the two entrances are in conflict, how do I deal with that? So we're not the first to ask that question. A Talmud, a student of Rav Hutner, asked that question. It's in Pachet Yitzchak, Igros Uksavim, page 184. A Talmud of Rav Hutner asked this question, and he said, you know, my secular career, I'm leading a double life. I learned Torah, but I also enjoy being exposed to Mada. I, Hashem, I see Hashem's hand through, the Rambam writes this, we come to know Hashem through his creation, chemistry, biology, physics, I see the Yad Hashem. So I'm leading a dual life. I'm leading a double life. I'm leading a duplicitous life. I'm a fake. I'm a phony. I'm a fraud. That's what the Talmud said to Rav Hutner. I'm either in the yeshiva or I might as well be a sheikh. It's a guy. I'm in the world of secular knowledge. How can I be in both? So Rav Hutner answered him and he said, someone who switches between living in a room in a hotel and a room in their house. If you're living in your house, you're living in a room in a hotel, you're leading a double life. Which is your home? Is it your home or is it the hotel? But a person who rents a house that has many rooms is leading one life. If you synthesize them and you bring them together and at the core and at the center is Torah, is Hashem, is authentic Torah, then you're leading a synthesized life. You're leading a synthesized life. So my, my feeling in my Shara Kolal attitude and life 
in which on any given day, I could be learning a piece from Rav Shechter and a piece from the Menchaz Asher and a piece from the Melech and a piece from the Meir and drawing from all over. On any given day, I could be learning in this base Medrash and then going to that Tish and then finishing at that Fabrengen. That it's not leading a dual life. It's not having multiple personality disorder. It's synthesis. It's integration. We're weaving it into this rich tapestry of living in a Shara Kolel where these things are not contradicting and they're not in conflict with one another, but they're synthesized together. Okay, we, go over, we have a bunch of live, but I want to just jump in. Is What is when they do contradict each other? When you have people that have to dive in before Shkia and people that dive in three hours after Shkia. How, do, how, do, how does that connect? So when I went to Square for Yontif, so the first time I went, I didn't realize that they were davening Shacharis after this man, way after this man. So my Masora, from where I come from, that's not acceptable. So the next time I went, I brought a minion of guys. And with the Rebbe's permission, I found that afterwards. I didn't ask. It was one of those. Afterwards, I found that he was okay. And Yechidus, he told me it was okay. So I, I, I went into New Square and I took what I could out of that experience of the vibrancy and the energy and the tish and the tzidkos of the Rebbe and the shirayim and the shalashudas and the lights out and all that I didn't have in my world and didn't have growing up and didn't have in my yeshiva, but it spoke to a very deep part of my neshama and still does. Today I wear a tish bekesha in my home and we have a shalashudas in our shul where we sing this Moldova three times and you did nefesh and ka'echsof and the lights are out. And then there's a shir in the morning, a chabura in lamdas. These things are not a stereo, they're not a contradiction to one another. We can synthesize and we can integrate and we can live, but we still have to stay true to who we are in the world of halacha. So the answer to your question is, as much as I love the world of New Square, but my understanding, I wasn't knocking Chabad, I'm not knocking New Square. My understanding of the halacha doesn't allow davening in those manim. So I was still makbed to daven my zman while still being able to live and draw out from that beauty. No, no, I brought a minion. I brought a minion. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. Okay, beautiful. So we have a lot of live questions. Um, let's jump on them. You're on. Yeah. He's on. Hi. Say hello. You're unmuted. CD? Obviously, uh, yeah. Yep. Try again. Okay, go. I put him to sleep. No, he's here, he's here. Maybe, he's, maybe his mic is not working. Because... Let's go to the next live one. Give it a minute. Yeah, hi, hi. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for having us. And uh, this, is, this has been amazing. Thank you so much, Rabbi Goldberg. Uh, my question is, we're, we're kind of experimenting with this question right now. Should one live in a community that he doesn't necessarily always agree with and feel comfortable with personally from a hashkafic level? What happens if this community is in a higher madriga that you would like your kids to get to? The question is, is this a stira for the children? Because we're in a community that's a little bit more yeshivish for us, but we know that from our perspective, we want the kids to have just a higher level of learning that we feel for, for our children in this community. But as a father, I don't always necessarily feel like I fit in. I don't always wear a jacket or a hat and things like that. But my kids, I want them to have a higher level than what I had, but at the same time have some of the view that I, that I took from my more, let's say, more modern community. Is this a stira? Is this, a, is this not a great message in Chinuch? And are we playing with fire? It's a great question. First of all, come with the Boca Raton, but it's a great question. And, and I would tell you a, a few things. You Number have one... Make, you have to make a 10th minion, though. Uh, Mir Tashem would be our greatest pleasure. Um, so I'll tell you a few things. Number one, there's absolutely nothing wrong with an aspirational Judaism. There's nothing wrong with faking it till you make it of the life that you want for your children to be better than ourselves. Now, it won't ever happen if we don't live it ourselves. There is no greater instrument or tool or compass that is attuned to hypocrisy than a child. Children can call out hypocrisy faster than anyone or anything else in the world. So if we're demanding of them but not living ourselves, it's not going to work. How do we teach our children the mitzvah of Talmud Torah? How do we teach our children? The shiftach b'veisecha. So you say no technology and don't watch that Narish kite, but they know that we see and that we watch and that we have it all. What do we do in our home? We go on vacation, we're on a business trip. Do we take the Rebbe Shalom with us? That is the greatest classroom our children will ever have is what we provide. We have to be sincere. We have to be honest. But at the same time, we can be aspirational for them. I had an uncle, Olav Shalom, Rabbi Eli Lazar of Lakewood, New Jersey. My uncle, Rabbi Lazar, so he was a tremendous person. After he was nifter, after he passed away, they collected 
the Divrei Torah that he said at family simchas, a beautiful gift, a beautiful contribution. And at one of the brisim of one of his grandchildren, he said a beautiful, beautiful thought. I've quoted it many times because it speaks very deeply to me. He was such a, such a special person, a lost to Klai Yisrael. So he said, you know, we say at a bris of a baby, Ze'akatan gadol yiyeh. And this beautiful insight, Ze'akatan gadol yiyeh, what does it mean? The mora gadol, mora katan, we're describing the sun, the moon, a reflection, a baby right now is only a reflection of the parents. They should become a source of light themselves. Countless beautiful divrei Torah and Ze'akatan gadol yiyeh. He said something very simple. He said, don't read it, Ze'akatan gadol yiyeh. Don't read it, may this small child one day become great. He said, read it, Ze'akatan gadol mimeni yiyeh. May this child be greater than me. Because what happens in Frumkite? You know, we find that in the world of Frumkite, many people, most people, I see this across the spectrum of the Torah world, they want their children to be exactly like them. Don't come five minutes later to sure than I come. Shake it. But don't go five minutes earlier than I go. What are you, holier than now? You should go to shul exactly the time I go. Learn exactly the amount that I learn. Follow the exact tashkachas and kashas that I follow. Many people want their children to be, don't out from me, but chalila, don't under from me, be exactly where I am. So he said, what are we, what's our brach at a bris? What are we hoping for? Zakatan, God me many here. Could there be anything greater in the world than a child surpassing a parent? Ravayim Lechzusin Zatzal, the Rosh Hashiva of Haratzion and Gush, has son of Yitzchak Lichtenstein, who today is the Rosh Hashiva of Torah Vedas. So he was once uh, at a, a public forum and a parent got up and asked of Lichtenstein. He said, you know, my child went to Israel and go to the front and my child came home and my child is questioning our kashras and I'm turning to you as one of those Rosh Yeshiva who are inspiring these uh, children, flipping them out. What can be done about it? My own child came on. Is now doubting my kashras. I'm livid. I'm upset. I'm disappointed. I'm frustrated. How could it be? So if Lichtenstein said, said, you know, I have a child who also went to a different yeshiva than I'm the Rosh Yeshiva of, and went to a different derech, and came home, and had certain chumras and kashrits, had certain questions in my kitchen. And I want you to know, I've never been prouder in my life, that my son wants to be even more machmir and kashras. We made whatever changes gladly, and I couldn't be more proud of his son today, the Rosh Yeshiva of, of Torah Vedas. It was good enough for Avlichistin, it can be good enough for us, but our hope should be for our children to surpass us. So it's a beautiful wish that you have, and I give you a bracha that taka, our children should be as inspired and more inspired. But back to your question. So is it hypocritical to live in that community? Here's the reality. The reality is there's almost no perfect exact community that any of us are going to fit in entirely. We're going to make concessions. We're going to adapt. We're going to be flexible. We're going to have to supplement. Most people, when it comes to the education of their children, the yeshiva, the seminary, the school, the Mesiaco, whatever you send your children to, it's not exactly a perfect fit. So some have to supplement more Torah learning. Some have to supplement more love of Israel, have to supplement more secular education academics. Most of us recognize that we're going to choose the one that's most aspirational and supplement on the side. And I think if that's your attitude that says, we're in a community that represents our aspiration. I want my children to live this and to aspire for this. It's not entirely me where I am now, but it's where I hope to be and where I'm trying to be. And I'm going to supplement the parts that I believe in and I care about that aren't part of this community so that my children will graduate my home. Parents underestimate their influence. The yeshiva, the school is a big influence. The community and friends are a big influence. But ultimately, children look a whole lot like what they saw at their Shabbos table. So when we supplement and when we complement and we emphasize what's important and what matters to us, even with what else they're getting elsewhere, we are rounding out the child as a whole. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, let's go back. Is your mic working now? I hope so. Do you hear me? Okay. Okay. So as a parent of a few kids still figuring it out, I occasionally bump into other kids around town who look just like my kids looked as they started that winding journey. But I only have that one minute as like I pass by them to show them my love, my compassion, my understanding. So I smile, but that kid might still walk away with his narrative. Everyone's judging me because they consider themselves judged regardless. And I want to just take this opportunity to tell all those people who feel judged that maybe you're assuming the worst about the lifestyle that you left behind without sufficient evidence that we are all actually judging you. Thank you very much for taking this opportunity. I echo that. I think it's a fantastically important comment. Unfortunately, a vocal minority might make people feel a way, but it's important for everyone to look and, re and, re and, and 
uh, recognize that that's the minority, it's not the majority. The majority from the totality of the beautiful Torah community are loving and warm and hopefully non-judgmental. And unfortunately, sometimes people have a bad experience from uh, the yachid, from the individual. But I think it's a very, very important uh, comment that you made. I'll tell you a great story of Ravari Levin. It's one of my favorite stories. A tzaddik in our time, the tzaddik of Yerushalayim, the great tzaddik Ravari Levin. Everyone knows he was the Rav of Nachlaot, beautiful little uh, neighborhood of little alleyways near Machan Yehud in Yerushalayim. He was the Rav of the prisoners, the Rav of the Etzel and the Lachi. He was the Rav of the lepers. Rav Ari Levin was the great tzaddik of Yerushalayim. So there was a boy who grew up in Nachlaot, a very firm boy, a Yerushalmi boy. He grew up very religious. And at some point he decided to take his yarmulke off. He decided to not be religious anymore. So he avoided Rav Ari Levin for many months. Rav Ari Levin would walk one way. He went down a different alleyway. Whatever he did, he always looked with a watchful eye to see if the tzaddik was walking so he could avoid him and not have to run into him. But one day, lo and behold, he turned the corner. Punk, there was Ravari Levin. There was nothing he could do to avoid it. So Ravari Levin, the great tzaddik, said to this boy who he knew since his bar mitzvah, he said, tell me, I haven't seen you in so long. I can't help but feel that you're avoiding me. Have I done something to offend you? Have I done something to hurt you? I'm so sorry. How come I haven't seen you? So the boy, very sheepishly, very shy, looking down, ashamed, said, Rebbe, to tell you the truth, you've done nothing. But I'm no longer the person I was when you knew me as a child. I'm no longer wearing a yarmulke. And I was so afraid, so embarrassed, so shy, so ashamed to run into you. So Ravari Levin said to him the following. He said, listen to me. I'm a very short man. I can only see what's in your heart. I can't see what's on your head. That's what Ravari Levin said. Now, did Ravari Levin not care about Torah and mitzvahs and halacha? Was Ravari Levin some open-minded, modern, pluralistic? Ravari Levin was the tzaddik of Yerushalayim. But it was good enough for Ravari Levin, the tzaddik of Yerushalayim, to turn to this boy and make sure that even though he had walked away, what do you think Ravari Levin yelled? Shagets! Did he throw rocks at him? Did he tell him how could you? No, he said to this boy, I'm a very short man. I can't see what's on your head. I can only see what's in your heart. Here's a, another interesting question that came in. Um, my husband is extremely close-minded. He still lives in the 80s. He doesn't get it that the Chinuch world has changed. How do I explain to him that being open-minded is not a goyish thing? Being open-minded is not a goyish thing. Well, again, you have to define what open-minded means. You have to define what open-minded means. Every time you learn halacha, you're open-minded. No, you only learn the machaber, you also learn the ramah. You learn the Beis Yosef and the Bach, the Taz and the Shach, Pischei Tshuva, you only learn the Moshe, you also learn the Chazanish. How do you define open-minded? You only learn Abai or Rava. What, what does it mean, open-minded? Anything different. Okay, so again, Adarabah Adarabah. Our whole system of Torah learning is the journey of analyzing different views. Now, there's a system that guides us towards a conclusion of those views when it comes to Psaq and when it comes to Halacha. But our whole experience of Torah learning is to see different views, is to understand different viewpoints, is we're going to end Sefer Bracious with the Shivtei Ka. We're not going to end with one definitive Shevet. You know, every generation, there was a Yitzchak and there was a Yishmael, there was a Yaakov and there was an Esav, there was a Yosef and there was a Yehuda, Yosef and his brothers. In fact, there's a parish who says, why didn't Yosef, when he's in Mitzrayim, ever contact his father Yaakov? He rises to the Viceroy of Egypt. He could have contacted Yaakov. Why didn't he? So there's an understanding that suggests because all that Yosef did is he looked, he looked at his father, he looked at his grandfather, he looked at his great grandfather, and he said, every generation, there was the chosen one and the rejected one. I must be the rejected one. I was thrown away. So he didn't even bother reaching out. Of course, that wasn't the case. Yosef was Yosef, and the reunion was, was unbelievable. But the Shvatim, the different Shvatim represents the fact that we have these different viewpoints. There's a beautiful insight of the Emes Yaakov, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky. I told you I have many, many Mikoros, and I'm happy to go there and to share many to share many more. Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky in his Emes Yaakov, he says the following. He says, in Sefer Ba Midbar, we have the Degolim. We know the camp, the tribes encamped around the Mishkan and the Midbar. And they were to the north, the, the uh, south, the east, and the west. Which tribes were designated to go where? And the tribes, the, the Shvatim, they weren't just arbitrary. Every Shevet had a logo. Every Shevet had an insignia. Every Shevet had an identity. Every Shevet had an individuality. There were times in Jewish history the Shvatim weren't allowed to marry into one another. The Shvatim were separate. They were distinct. They were apart from one another. So the question of Yaakov asks is, I don't understand. In the Midbar, you have the Shvatim. So how come there wasn't tremendous period in Klai Yisrael? 
How come there wasn't enormous machlokis in Klai Yisrael? How did they all get along? How did they work it out? He writes, in a minion of Zechan Yerim, he said that Shvatim, as God, Acharuvim, Shimon, Kedil Asad, is in an Adgon, Velachar Tamua, Halo Tekev, Kishiyatu Bnei Yisrael, Mitzrayim, Yatu Bnei Yisrael, Tzivu Sam, immediately, the moment we left Mitzrayim, we left under separate logos, separate flags, separate insignias, separate yarmulkes, separate schools. So I don't understand. How does it not create a sense of period of lavavos? Be'emes in adgon l'choru period of lavavos. Zevade shekotseva yesh ba'ezah semel miyuchad hatziyum shayubo kol regel v'degel degel v'degel zetzen kol shev v'shevi yesh tchuno shi'if miyuchadas. Each shevet had a different identity, had different goals, had a different aim. So why didn't it divide? Why didn't it destroy? Why didn't it obliterate Klal Yisrael that we were all separate? So listen to what he says. He says, "Nimtza ki lechora hadgalam garmo lepirah lavavos mikaven shahayal lekula merkaz echad haynu hamishkan kulanu chonam misaviv la mishkan ein ze garam lepirud ala kol echad omir al mishmar tam yuchedes lo ve ein kan shem pirud." You know why there was no division? You know why there was no machlokus? You know why there was no fallout? Because at the center of the encampment sat the Mishkan. As long as the Mishkan is the center of our diversity, we have a tagline in our shul. The tagline of our shul is valuing diversity, celebrating unity. How did we arrive at that tagline? From the Semes Lyankov. Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky you authored our tagline. He'll never know it. Now he knows it. But he authored our tagline. What does it mean, valuing diversity? You know, we use that term diversity. Diversity. It's a terrible term. We tolerate diversity. We tolerate diversity. The word tolerate is a terrible term. You tolerate slow Wi-Fi, and you tolerate a bad rash, and you tolerate a delay on your Amazon package. You don't tolerate a fellow Jew to tolerate diversity. The Sri Daesh has an essay, Sachaya Nechimivakesh. He's writing to reform and conservative, and he says, stop tolerating me. I want you to love me, and I'll love you. Jews don't tolerate one another. They love one another. So we don't tolerate, we value the diversity. Some people say, I tolerate diversity. There's someone on my block. There's a kid in my kid's school. There's somebody I know. They're different. I'm willing to tolerate. We're very diverse, but they tolerate the diversity. We don't tolerate fellow Yidden. We love them. We embrace them. We see the best in them. You don't, so we value diversity. The problem with diversity is diversity could lead to divisiveness. Diversity, like the Emerson Yankel, the Rav Yaakov says, the separate Degolm, the separate logos, separate insignias could lead to machlokas. It could lead to period. It could lead to division. So how does the diversity not lead to how does the diversity not lead to a division? The answer is when you celebrate unity. We don't celebrate uniformity. Uniformity is everyone has to look the same, vote the same, be the same, act the same, dress the same. We don't believe in uniformity. We believe in unity. You can only have unity when you have diversity. If you don't have diversity, you don't have unity. You have uniformity. So Rabbi Yankov writes that the Shvatim there were. So you say, how do I know I should be open minded? Was Yaakov Avinu open-minded? Yosef open-minded? You're open-minded? We have 12 Shvatim. I didn't make this up. This is not new. I didn't introduce this in our, in our uh, generation. This is our history. Shivan Panam Torah and the Shiv Teka and the Refresh writes about the rainbow, Migdal Bavel, and the diversity of the colors. One prison, the Ribbon Shalom comes through and he's refracted in separate rays of light. And Rav Yaakov writes, the Mishkan is at the center of this diversity. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid. I could learn a Pachad Yitzchak, a Mechtav Melio. I could learn the Rav and Rav Cook. I could also learn Ravitcha Meyer, and I could learn a Friedlander, and I could learn all these worlds of Machshava, and they're not a steward of one another. If I live in one house with separate rooms, if I live in separate buildings, said Rav Hutner, it's a stira. But if I live in one house with separate rooms, I don't have to be afraid. I'm richer for it. I'm better for it. I'm more inspired by it. I'm closer to the Ribbon Shalom as a result of it. Well, what should she tell her husband? <laughs> About being open-minded? What should she tell her husband? He, that, he, 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 doesn't, he doesn't want to hear this. This is like... This is not as often. Okay, so first of all, why does she have to... Maybe she could be open-minded even if it's closed-minded. Why does she have to impose her open-mindedness on him? Why she can't she have her pursuits while he... Of her kids. Oh, so that's a practical question. How do you navigate and how do you negotiate the practical implication and application of choosing chinuch of children? But if you're telling me that there are things that speak to her that don't speak to him, he's locked into a shavit, he's comfortable there, he's entitled to it too. Let me defend the husband for a second. I was accused earlier of not defending husbands. Let me defend the husband for a second. The husband married her and Mistama, there was a shadchan and Mistama, they got married on the terms that they're going to live a certain shavit. She's changing the rules, not him. He says, I'm locked into the shavit. 
Who are you now come? You want to break down the barriers of our Shevet? You're joining Goldberg Shara Kolo? Get back here. We're in the Shevet. This is the terms of our marriage, of the Shevet. So that's a Shalom Bayi Shaila. And that needs to be navigated and negotiated. It needs to be discussed. Can she pursue broader interests? Can she have, can she nourish her open mind in a way that won't compromise him and the Shevet that he lives in? She's not going to advocate that the children also need to okay. read or watch or be yeah. exposed. She's going to let the children be the children, let the children live in the Shevet, even while for herself and her own avoda, she feels she wants to see more. Very good. I will not be up much longer. Got it. Okay. Um, I have one more live, but they're getting on the middle song on their different name because I had a problem with computer. But I want to ask this question. It's a very, very powerful question. Somebody just sent it in, actually. How do you teach children growing up in, their, in a community that branches of Jewish world have something special and unique about them while we choose to live in, in insular communities for certain spiritual advantages? Even look that look more modern may have certain strengths in specific areas that we don't. So, for example, somebody lives in this thing. We raise our children in this little bubble. But yet, we're, how do they know that, that the Yidin Boka Riton, there's a Rabbi Goldberg who's a nice Choshwe Yid and has so many miles that we don't have, vice versa? So I, here's, I want to destroy your premise. The premise of that question, in my humble opinion, I would say unless you're living in the most insular society, and I would argue even there the premise is wrong, but certainly if you're outside the most insular society, the premise of the question is wrong. We're not protecting our children and we're not insulated. That's what I find to be kind of the joke of the whole conversation, as if I'm saying a chiddush or something radical. The reality is flip through Mishpacha magazine, Ami magazine, or even Amodiyah Yatet, flip through them, and you'll see the countless Jewish organizations and the diversity of the speakers that they're putting forth. They began to promote the Aguda Convention. You go to the Aguda Convention, and the Aguda Convention is advocating exactly what I'm saying. Now, they're doing it maybe a more narrow sense than I'm saying, so, for example, they're not inviting Rav Shechter. They didn't invite Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, Zuchon Lavracha, to speak at the Agoda Convention. Maybe it's a more narrow sense, but they have Hasidim, they have Misnagdim, they have Ashkenazim, they have Sfardim, they have Balabatim, they have Rabbonim. The Agoda Convention itself is providing a Shalakola for people. So, again, maybe it's not as broad as I'm suggesting the Sharakola could be, but the idea that anyone today in Frumka and Tavshin Ben Bez is locked in, the idea that anybody is in such an insular, insulated world in which all they have is their Rebbe. They're not watching, they're not listening, they're not reading, they're not going to the convention, the conference of anybody else. It's just not happening. It's not happening. Part of what, why we've arrived at this point, part of why I feel this way is because of technology. It has been a game changer. It has changed the world in which we're living. Go on Torah anytime. Forget why you Torah. Go on Torah anytime. Go on any of the plethora of Torah websites that we are extraordinarily blessed to have in our time and go see the width and breadth, the diversity of the people speaking on those websites, men and women, Ashkenazim and Tzfarim, Hasidim, and you'll see the width and breadth. So this is not me. Like everybody's really locked in. They have one Rebbe. They read one newspaper, one newsletter from their Rebbe, and no one sees anything else in the world. And here I am with this radical idea. Open your mind and be exposed to other things. You think you're not exposed to other things every time you turn on throughout Corona, especially. It was the only way that we were connected. And every organization had these multiple speakers. My dear friend, Charlie Arari. I love Charlie Arari. You think Charlie Arari belongs to one world? You think this speaker belongs to that one world? You think this, the OU has its convention, as good as its convention, and they are putting forth diverse personalities, diverse speakers. This, what you do every Sunday night, and the diverse speakers that you present is exactly an expression and a manifestation of what I'm advocating for. You're bringing on 500, 600, 400 people, participants just live. Who knows by a month from now how many will have watched it after the fact. You're bringing on a th thousands of people and you are exposing them to diverse personalities. You're taking a risk having a guy like me on. You're exposing them to diverse personalities because my point is that fundamentally, this is how we're all living already. So if we're living it already, why are we apologizing and why are we defensive and why are we ashamed and why are we feeling guilty? Let's embrace it and let's harness it and let's channel it and let's protect it, and let's make sure that we have strong boundaries for it. But we're essentially doing it already. We're doing it already. So again, I want to come back. 
If you belong to a shevet and you're comfortable and happy there, I'm not telling a satmar chassid that he should become a chabadnik. I'm not telling a chabadnik he should become an orthodox. I'm not telling a sfardi he should become an Ashkenazi. If a person belongs to a shevet in their worldview and their personal practice in the Messiah and the tradition, tavo alacha, bracha, live there, enjoy it. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. Don't, I'm, I'm not asking you to change. All I'm saying is, if you're like me, and you don't belong to any one world, and you don't want to be locked in a box, and you recoil when someone says, he's a modern Orthodox rabbi. No one's ever said this, but he's a Hasidish rabbi. He's a Litvish rabbi. He's an Ashkenazi rabbi. You know, in our shua, connected I am to our Sephardim, and how familiar I've become over the last 23 years with Sephardim and Hagim and practices, I'm a Sephardi rabbi. We have six daughters and we had one son. Our son is our seventh after our six daughters. Baruch Hashem, when he was born, we don't take it for granted. I want to give a bracha to everybody who's longing and desperate and wants to have children. Rebun Shalom should give you children and grandchildren. It's an enormous bracha. No one should ever take it for granted. When we had our son after six daughters, it was unbelievable. So because we live the Shara Kolel, every part of our community wanted to celebrate his birth according to their minhag. So we had a Brit Yitzchak. We had a Shalom Zachar. We had a, we said Shema the night before. At the bris, we had all of them in Hagim. It was a beautiful thing. It was a beautiful thing. So again, if a person's comfortable in their shevet, live there. But if you're not sure what shevet you're in, or you feel that a piece of you belongs in different shvatim, and you're integrating and incorporating it, and you're in the Shara Kolel, then join me. Then welcome. Then we're together. There's room for us. There's a world. There's a community of us. And we don't need to be apologetic or ashamed. And I'll just end by saying, I'm not ending the whole night, I'm ending this little piece by saying, well, why is this so important to me? Why is this so important to me? Because the world around us and the wrong influences in the wrong around us have a vested interest in keeping us apart. They have a vested interest in keeping us apart. Some of the leadership, and this, I'll say cynically, that some of the people who profit off of our having divisiveness, the people who made a career and profit off of our having machlokas between one another, of keeping us separate and apart, of trying to create an antagonism between us, they have a vested interest in labeling us and putting us in box and keeping us apart and making us separate. But we don't have to let them win and we shouldn't let them win. On our podcast, I'll give a little shameless plug for Behind the Bima. On our podcast, we had Eli Pelé, the founder of Mishbacha Magazine. And he spoke about part of the, the Mishbacha Magazine is to create social change that people did not know you know, if you're part of one world, you didn't read about Gedolim of another world. You weren't exposed to the Shivan Panam of Godless in Torah. And there's social chain and introduction opening people's mind that he has achieved and that he wanted to do and that he wanted to do. So there are forces that are opposed and working against what I am advocating. They want to keep us separate. They want to keep us apart. They want to keep us locked in. They want to say, you're a YU guy. You're a Chavetz Chaim guy. You're a Lakewood guy. You're, they want us to be apart, but we don't have to let them separate us. We can transcend and rise above it. And we can say, I'm part of it all. I sat in the different shiurim and I learned the different farm and I connect to it all unapologetically and with pride and I'm better and I'm richer for it. I think this is the vision of Avram Avinu. Success in last week's parsha. What does it mean Hashem Be'erach is Avram Bakol? So there was a certain worldview. The Ibn Ezra says Bakol means he was Baruch V'yamim Ba'osher, the Kavod Ubanim. Avram had Allah brachas that a person could have. That's not true, because right after he was blessed with everything, he goes to look for a wife for Yitzchak. So obviously he didn't have everything. So what does it mean that he had everything? So there's a beautiful, beautiful insight of what it means Hashem Berach is Avram Bakol. Bakol means that Avram had a panoramic perspective. He saw the Rebona Shalom everywhere. He wasn't threatened and he wasn't defensive and he wasn't scared. For Avram Avinu, there was a panoramic view of the world. And he saw the Rebona Shalom in everything. He discovered Hashem, he promoted Hashem, and he, and he found Hashem in everything. It was with a sense of bakol. Hashem berach is Avram. He gave Avram a bracha to live a life in which he didn't have to isolate, and we didn't have to lock in, and he didn't have to be in a box. Hashem gave Avram a bracha that Hashem berach is Avram bakol. It was a panoramic view in which he saw the world, and he saw the Rebun Shalom. You know, we say, Malah haaretz kinyanecha. The world is filled. So the simple pshat, Malah haaretz kinyanecha, means that Hashem has a kinyan on the whole world. But the Svar Makadoshim say, no, Malah Arts Kinyanecha. The world is filled with opportunities to make a Kinyan and Hashem. Avram, Hashem Berach is Avram Bakol. Avram had this perspective, this panoramic view, this ability, this vision to see Hashem everywhere. But he didn't just have it. He gave it to Yitzchak, who gave it to Yaakov. And that's what we say in our benching is that we longed for it. Harachamonu Yivarech Osanov Kol Asher Lanu. 
We want the kol asher lanu. What is it? Commotion is borcha of a saint of Avram Yaakov. Bakol, mikol, kol. With Avram it says bakol. With Yitzchak it says mikol. And with Yaakov it says kol. With Yaakov it says kol. So you see that there's a transmission of the sense of kol. We have the capacity for a panoramic view of the world. We have the capacity to put on glasses that see Hashem everywhere, Malah Arts Kinyanecha, to make a Kinyan of Hashem all around us. Not only with this Rebbe or the Sefer, not only with this Sanhagar or this Mesorah, but all around us. Hashem Berach is Avon Bako. And we daven and we long Bako Miko Ko. We want that Ko. We want that panoramic view. We don't want to see so myopically. If you have a myopic view, you, you're missing so much all around you. But if we have this panoramic view, then you see Hashem, you see the richness of Hashem. I wish I could take my camera right now. I'm at home and show you my, my base measures, my study at home, the different forum that are here and the diversity of this forum that are here and the forum that I try to learn because I feel I'm, I'm only that much better because of it. Okay, let's go to this live question. You're on. Can't hear you. No, oh, the mic's not working. Yeah, that's <laughs> good. No, he's not. Yeah, I'll mute. Can I unmute it? Okay, how is that? Much better. Oh, okay. Thank you so much for taking my question. I want to thank the hosts. I want to thank um, Rabbi Goldberg. Uh, unbelievable words and um, very, very uh, exciting and the delivery and answer of all your questions. And thank, thank the listeners as well uh, for the opportunity to ask this question. Um, my question has to do with... Um, where we know halachas or minag zutaira, so like a kippah, we know at one point in time it was a minag, and we know stories where people were mercer mus- nefesh and literally gave up their lives in some cases to make sure that they wore a kippah. Their story after story. Um, it's a practical question, but I, I'm I'm in between two uh, two mountains, which is often where I find myself. I think that's like the the place of a yid, right? We went through Yitzias Mitzrayim. We went on Yamsuf. We had over here. We had over here. We have a derech in the middle that we're trying to transverse to fr- find the middle path. So that's the spirit of my question here. Um, I heard something. You know, the Nefesh Chaim says that some people think there are there are there are kahilas that think that Tveikis, and we know from David Melech that Tehillim is. He asked it that Tehillim is Tveikis, and the Nefesh Chaim says says not like that. That's not the Iker Tveikis, right? Um, there's another Misa that, that happened to me. I asked an altar mirror. I was talking to an altar mirror once. He was a mashkiach in a yeshiva I once learned in. And um, he said that Rev Walbe used to go and learn, um, he used to go and learn Sisrei Taira by uh, an Av based in, I think in Petak Tikva, who was a Hasidic Shayid. And Rev Walbe went to go learn. And, and this altar mirror went to go ask that. He was very curious about Hasidus and the derech of Vaida of Hasidus. And he went to this Av Beisdin and he asked him to teach him the derech of Vaida of Hasidus. So what he answered him was like this. Um, he asked him, he asked him, where's your father from? Where's your grandfather from? Lita. Uh, where did he learn? In the mirror. And where did you learn? In the mirror. And he said, so it's not for you. It's not for you. And he said, but why? I'm, I'm very, very interested. I'm open to this. And he said, you'll come out the other side, a chalent with no tam. <laughs> That's what he said to him. Now, at the same time, I was being invited to go to uh, Uman many, many times. And I just, I was busy. I never went. But this same Alta Mirror said, I asked him if there's a value to it for me, maybe. And he said, I have to tell you, there's something to hearing a Menya Heishmei Rabba in front of 10,000 people. You know, there's something special about that. So he, even he had this you know, there was a duality there. Then then there's a Misa with Rav Meish Shapira that, you know, he had a daughter who passed away very, very young. And and with this, I'll end my question. And I heard from a big Tamil Chochman Yerushalayim named Rav Nassan Weiss that Rav Meisha was struggling with something. He was struggling with how much to <laughs> him was enough to say for his daughter who was terminally ill before it became Bittal Taira. So that's a huge, huge madriga. That's I mean, I get chills every time I, I tell that story. I certainly feel the same chills from the first time I heard it. When halacha and these things, it's not so easy to pluck somebody out of their shavit. You know, there was a rabbi in Yerushalayim that told me to learn with the Hasid the Shayid who was having some questions. And we learned the Kuzari together secretly. And uh, secretly, we had to learn the Kuzari secretly. And it was beautiful. And we developed a very, very nice, a very, very nice relationship. Um, I certainly had no intention of taking, I had no intention of making him into a Kalal, you know, a, a 13th gate yid or anything. I respected where he came from and I respected his questions eye to eye. 
what what happens when there's you know if a minig is uh, how easy it is it to, to sort of say you know this 13th gate is great and and it is great i hear the the godless coming from you Rabbi goldberg and i respect it tremendously uh it makes me want to come visit boca um but you know do, do you understand the question sort of in, in between these uh, yeah two I, let me let me rephrase the question first of all thank you so much Yoshi, for sharing the question and those stories and your svarum and your background i'm trying to see what i can see, learn about you, you, see you, what's in them. you see what's in them <laughs> yeah i'm trying i'm trying to check it out i'm trying to check it out um you know it, it, it's a complicated question you know revolba's grandson just moved to our community in boca i'll give a little flex a little plug and, you know, I was talking to him about his grandfather. He grew up very close to his grandfather. Revol Badassan, was in the army, and he welcomed him back to his yeshiva in his, in his army clothing. Revol himself was a very complex person. And Revolba's own background, which we don't have to get into in terms of at one point Revolba discovered Yiddishkeit, is in itself a fascinating history and a background. Our Gedoli Yisrael, I don't think we're necessarily, now again, Shimon Panam Lagablas, we have different Gedoli Yisrael who function and conduct themselves differently in different ways as well. But Gedoli Yisrael are not afraid by this. Gedoli Yisrael had extraordinary relationships with one another. The Rav and Rav Hutner and the Rebbe, they were in Berlin, they were in university together, and they, they shared a relationship that went on, a tremendous respect for one another. Our, our, our Gedolim were able to see the godless of different worlds. They were respectful. They were respectful. I think this needs to be said that even those who feel comfortable in their Shevet and they're proud of their Shevet and they're happy in their Shevet should minimally maintain a respect for other Shvatim, to not criticize and condemn and put down, to not feel that their Shevet can only be correct if they knock others down. You know, in the Parshas Korach, there are so many miracles. There are four miracles that happen. There are four ways that the Rebbe Shalom and Paskins, that Moshe and Aaron are the leaders, not Korach Vadaso. What do I need for? Okay, it's enough. The ground opened up and swallowed them up. Mamash, unparalleled, unprecedented. You had to knock a miracle, knock a miracle, knock a miracle. Do you know what the answer is? There's two ways that you can be higher than someone, either by knocking them down below you or by your rising up. So until then, the ground had opened up and they fell in. Now they took the staffs and they, and they blossomed with flowers. Because Borcha wanted to make sure that Moshe and Aaron were not the leaders, the default leaders, because everyone else was knocked down. They were the leaders because they blossomed above. So some people in their shavit feel, I can only feel pride and I'm only confident of my shavit if I criticize, condemn, and knock down all the other shvatim. Be happy with your shavit without having to criticize any other. Make room for the other shvatim. Love the other shvatim. Respect the other shvatim, even if you're comfortable and even if you're happy in yours. So Yoshi, to come back to your question, let me rephrase your question. Your question is, an impressionable young man or woman who is yet to have any sense of holding in Hashkafa Satora, who's just at the beginning, they're going to be a challenge. How will they make sense of a derech hachayim? How will they know how to live? Who are they and where do they fit in? And how do they belong? If from a very early age and an early stage, they're already exposed to everything. So if you're everything, you're nothing. To whom do you belong and what are you? Is that your question? Yeah. Sort of. You're, okay. So he's, so he's muted, but I think that's his question. I'm still trying to figure out how to apply the Zoom rules to real life Shiram. How you can mute and unmute and knock out and put in the waiting room and chat. If we could only incorporate these Zoom rules to real life Shiram, what a beautiful world it would be. Anyway, so Yoshi, I think the answer is that when I'm advocating the Shara Kolel, I'm not necessarily advocating it at the earliest and most impressionable age. I think a person does have to have a Rebbe and does go to a yeshiva or seminary and is in a certain path or track of life. They have parents and they have grandparents and they have a community. What I'm talking about is as we become more sophisticated and as we advance and as we begin to broaden our own horizons, which is true in life in general, the first and second grader has a much different, more narrow understanding of life than the person who's further further along and further on than others. So I'm not necessarily saying that we should do this at the earliest stage and the earliest. There's a piece of me that, by the way, wants to create a movement of yeshivas and elementary schools and kolalim of Shara Kolal, who are the Yidden, who are Stark and Frimkite, Bnei Aliyah, Yerashamayim, Torah, but who belong to the Shara Kolal. There's a piece of me that wants to create a whole movement, but then I wake up and the reality of me sets in, which is not necessarily that early not necessarily that stage. I'm not advocating it first thing. A little bit later on to be able to get there, to be able to do it. After I wrote this article called I'm Not a Modern Orthodox Rabbi, some people were very unhappy with me. Uh, but after I wrote this article, I learned of a community somewhere else that started a Thursday night Chabura Sharakolal. 
they get together, diverse chevra, and they have diverse limud, and they're trying to be exposed to and to learn and to embrace some of the things that they never knew before. You know what it's like? You know, it's an amazing, amazing insight. There was a Talmud of the Ramchal who, who writes that, what's the Navi anticipating? So he writes, he's describing our time where you have hundreds of thousands of shirim online and you have countless svarim in every language and there's, there's endless amount that can nourish us and yet we're thirsty for divrei Hashem, something that speaks to our neshama, something that speaks to who we are and that wakes us up and that makes us come alive. We're looking for it. And when we find it, we don't have to feel bad about it. As long as, again, it's within the legitimate boundaries of the Olam Torah, we don't have to feel bad about it. We don't have to feel bad about it. So I think that we don't have to be apologetic. And again, there's no chiv. If you're in a shevet, there's no obligation to go. There is an obligation to be respectful of the other shvatim. There's no obligation to trade shvatim. You don't have to necessarily remain in your shevet. You could belong to a shevet, but vacation in other shvatim, see and be exposed to. But for those who say, I'm not in any shevet. I live in the Shara Kolo. That's where I'm happy. That's where I live. Then come join me. I see a few people have asked where we can learn together. So it'd be my greatest honor if you learn together with me online. There's a website, RabbiEphraimGoldberg.org. You can find everything there or on youtube.com slash Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg, or on Y.U. Torah, or uh, I write a lot for Aish and uh, occasionally in Mishpach and other places. But it would be my greatest, greatest honor in the world if you join me and we learn together. I give a Pasha class every Tuesday. And Baruch Hashem, I'm very humbled that it has a very nice following. But what's the feedback I always get why people enjoy it? Because in any given Pasha year, on any given Pasha year, you never know who you're going to get that week. We go through the Pasha, and there could be there's a Kedushas Levi, and then there's a piece from Rav Soloveitchik, and then there's a Grizz, and then there's a Rivitcha Meyer, then there's a Maral Gurarie, then there's a Sfasemis, and then there's a this Chasidus, and then there's a little Lumdus, and then there's a Malach in the Parsha. And the whole Parsha is a journey of the Sharakolo. It's that all these different worlds have something to say in the Parsha. They're all using the same Parsha in order to communicate, in order to inspire, in order to be relevant, in order to be part of this world. So I, I just, it's such a beautiful place. It's a beautiful place. Not everybody has to come, but for those who want to be there, we should be comfortable, unapologetic, and we should know that we're not alone. That's the main thing. The reason I wrote that article and the feedback I got is that sometimes it feels very lonely. It feels very lonely. There's this chevra and there's that shevet and there's this movement and there's this shita and there's that world. And if I feel comfortable in lots of places, and if I'm drawing from many places, it could feel very, very lonely. You're not alone and don't feel lonely. There's a tzibur, there's a community of people who feel like you. Rabbi Goldberg, Mordek, let's go now to the closing part. Rabbi Goldberg. Closing? Little, I thought we were just getting started. I know, I know, you know, but uh, I have other shower calls to take care of also. <laughs> um, so coming in front of the Bima tonight and bringing it out to the Oilam. And it's been amazing. I appreciate it. And uh, I think I think we really, I think the, I think we had to actually covered the Nakuda tonight. Like, you know, I think the Oilam got it. I think it was a successful, like what we wanted to bring out, I think was uh, a little bit properly. I really appreciate it. Again, Ephraim Goldman coming on tonight, giving them physic, inspiration. Again, I think before you speak, you give anybody, you know, again, the information, if you want to give an email address, anybody can contact you or your website, Miguel Tonight, Shir, again, we're going to be learning the schus, a very special couple that I know well, who have not been blessed with children of their own. I'm again, I'm reaching out. It's a w- random weird request to our broad audience to see if anybody could help with the adoption process for this amazing couple. Please email Menachem at coachmenachem at gmail.com. And any information and anything you can be involved with, we'll forward to this amazing couple. This is be a share for them. Rabbi Gold, we'll give them a bracha. I give them a bracha. They and all those who long for children should be zocha to have children, to get nachas from the children, to get Yiddish nachas, Litvish nachas, Sharakol nachas. They should get every type of nachas. We should all have nachas from children, but they should be karov. A Kurdish baracha should answer, call Michelle is libel natova. And it should go smoothly and well. We should celebrate and share only simchas. I mean, and they said the child could wear a strimal, down hat, up hat, white socks. doesn't make a difference. They just want a beautiful child. And at any shower, I mean, next I mean. week, we're going to be starting to share at 9.30. It's a trial for a few weeks, just to move it back a little bit so we can have more time. <coughs> so we don't have to go to sleep so late. Again, if anybody wants to sign up to our WhatsApp uh, statuses that we can send at the flyer every week so they can let other people know about it and inspire people, please text me and WhatsApp me at 848-525. 0066 and save the number in your phone. Again, every Sunday night at 9.30 p.m. 
this year will be, um, and we have amazing people. Next week, we have Adam Lieberman, who's a world-famous salesperson, businessman. He speaks for Forbes, large companies. He spoke at many companies. I was actually at one of his conferences, and he's going to be discussing a topic that's relevant to anybody. It's called, we, we want it, we need it, we have it, for the people that want it, for the people that need it, and for the people that already have it. The challenges and opportunities that come with money and Pardosa, we're going to be discussing both angles. Um, so please tell everybody to join tonight. Everything's recorded. will be on menachembarnfield.com. If anyone has any questions, please reach out to coachmenachem at gmail.com. Tonight's share is 78, and it's going to be recorded. It'll be uploaded on our personal phone line at 848-777-GROW, G-R-O-W. It's 848-777-GROW. Again, I want to thank all the advertising sponsors, Lakewood Scoop, Rabbi Yanif Chazak, and Tachayla Kaufman and Shmuel Sam from JCN. Let's go to closing words. Coach Menachem, followed by Rabbi Efron. Thank you, Rabbi Goldberg. It was really an uh, eye-opener for many. Um, but I just want to I just want to uh, put out that piece that um, some people sent in, that there is a fear, and that it could be hard for many. It's much easier to belong to one place, and uh, it, it, it does take more of thinking and trying to figure out where you are, and you have to be ready for it. And like Rabbi Goldberg mentioned, uh, at, at a young age, you might, it might not be good eye to start. Eventually, you get older. You want to see, you know, what works for me, what does Hashem want for me. And I guess the age depends on everybody. Everybody's different. So you have to see if you're solid where you are and if you're ready to open that box and uh, let in some fresh air and see what's going on, which, which we see anyways. But yes, uh, a lot of people need that sense of belonging and knowing that this is where I am and I don't have to think, they're not ready to think so much. Sometimes it can be a, a, a journey. And I've, I've met many people who, once it's not the way they grew up, they have to go through, it's, it's, it's a challenge and that's part of growth to see, you know, what does work, what doesn't work and he's trying out and then there's ups and downs, which you don't like. You want to stay in your box, stay in your comfort zone. So yes, it is a challenge, but that's growth and that's might be what Hashem wants from us. And the last thing is that whenever you go out, you know, you go out the door, kiss the mezuzah before you try anything new, or you're going to look anywhere, try something new, say it's filet Hashem. Hashem, this is something that I'm working to get closer to you and help me to find the place where I can connect, something that talks to me, and the journey shouldn't be so hard. So wherever it is and whoever you are, filet is always needed. So thank you very much. And it's a shame we should be able to take this information to grow and get closer to Hashem. Amen. So I'll just say in closing, first of all, I echo everything that Coach Menachem just said. And, and I understand the attraction of staying in the box. I understand the, the appeal. It's comfortable. It's convenient. It's familiar. You can trust yourself. Other people know exactly who you are if you stay in the box. And if you're comfortable in the box, it's beautiful. Live there. Live there happily. and Live there comfortably. But the reality of the world we're living in is that boxes are corroding. They're falling apart around us. Even the people who want to live in the box to a certain degree can't because we are exposed to, we're invited to, we have opportunities to learn, to see. And I think that if we're in charge and controlling it, if we're filtering it and channeling it, if we are promoting it, then we could do a much better job of being kosher v'yosher than if the box just disintegrates and people find themselves in unfamiliar circumstances. So the degree to which that we can share and promote the Olam Torah, the Shara Kolel, the Shivan Panam La Torah, the Elvela Divrela Kim Chayim, that we can respect one another and we can love one another and we can make room for one another. And that even if we're proud and comfortable where we are, we recognize that there are other paths and there are other opportunities and one is not superior or inferior to another. To the best, we can learn from it. And if, even if we don't learn from it, minimally we can respect it. And in the end, all of it will make us much richer for it. It'll be a much more beautiful world. If a person feels connected to Amech, then Kulam Tzadikim. As long as you're part of Amech, so we should be Zoha to value our diversity and to celebrate unity with a sense of Achtos and Achtos that when Mashiach comes, everybody knows the uh, everybody knows the poem about Mashiach. You know the Mashiach poem, which hat he keeps coming to a different place, he's wearing the wrong hat. By the end, he gives up and he says, They're not ready for me yet. So I'll tell you, whenever Eli Mansur spoke in our shul once, he said, Again, I'm, I'm self promoting, but too bad, you invited me on. So I'm going to promote our community in closing. Everyone's invited. You're welcome to come. But Rebbe Mansur said, he said, you know, I think Mashiach is going to come through here first on his way. He said, and I'll tell you why. 
He said, because you know, when you have a parent, let's say you have a lot of children, this child doesn't talk to this child, this child doesn't get along with that child, the child will never host this child, that child doesn't get along with that child. But then you have a child, one of your children, who has all of their siblings. This is the child who they're all comfortable coming to. This is the child where they have the reunion app because they're all okay being there. That's where the parent wants to be most. Where does the parent want to be? If not among the child, where all the children could feel comfortable. So he said, Mashiach comes, he's going to come through this shul because all the children have a place and all the children can feel comfortable. There's a place for everyone here. Nobody's being locked out. So we should value our diversity, celebrate our unity. In the right time, we should open our minds, not too early and not with the wrong reasons in a way that we can celebrate the sense of achtos in order to ultimately to get close to the Ribbon Shalom in order ultimately to live the Amita Shal Torah and the Mitzvah Shem to be able to celebrate the Geula Shlema the Meir of Thank you Rabbi Goldberg for coming on. Beautiful. See everybody next uh, Sunday night, November 7th, uh, 9.30. Looking forward. To Let's Get Real, Coach Menachem. And we're changing the name to Let's Get Real with Coach Menachem Shahar Koyal. Good night. <laughs>